What's up guys? It's yo boy Oma Sensei. Welcome to Reborn a Soccer with a Gamer Interface. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Soccer saw the familiar man sleeping on the streets. It was the cabbage merchant. He seemed to have somehow lost his cabbage cart again. Getting closer to the man, Soccer smiled gently at the pitiful sight. Or, oh, you know, if you stopped being so obsessed with cabbages, you would be a successful merchant. He knew that for a fact as in the future, the cabbage merchant's company would be the biggest privately owned company in the world. Normally, Soccer wasn't someone who would care for other people, but this guy had some benefits attached to him. If he could get him to his side, then it would be very beneficial. Especially since he planned to develop the Southern Water Tribe in the future, and become the leader of it. Who are you? Asked the cabbage merchant, his nose red from the cold night. Sokka, are you coming or not? The guards called him out, trying to get him to come and drink with them. Sorry guys, I have to take care of something. I will be back. He waved them off, already having forgotten about what he was going to do before. Because in front of him, he saw a desperate man one that he could take advantage of. Ash Soccer POV. The cabbage merchant was quite an important character. He would become a powerhouse in the future, as long as he stopped messing around and trying to have his business be involved with cabbages. Though I wasn't exactly overjoyed while seeing Cora. I knew that Cabbage Corporation was a very big and key company to the automotive industry. I am Sokka, the son of the chieftain of the Southern Water Tribe. Though that sounds impressive I didn't have any power, political or otherwise with that title. People in the Southern Tribe might respect me for being my father's son, but that was it. They were poor people, and didn't have the time to listen to what a snot-nosed brat might say. At least in their eyes it would seem like that. The Cabbage Merchant didn't know that and looked at me with stars in his eyes. So, what do you want from me? He asked with a suspicious frown. I have no money, so there is nothing you can steal from me. I wasn't a thief, but if I was he still had shoes, clothes and good organs. Though I wasn't a thief, so I won't steal those. But even the poorest person had something that could be taken away from them. I am not a thief. I took out a couple of Earth Kingdom coins I had gotten from Kaishi Island and gave them to him. It isn't good to sleep in the streets like this. The man saw the coins and tiredly got up and quickly put them in his pocket. He looked at the guards' backs as they walked off to go and drink. Aren't you going with your friends? No. I shook my head while I would like to see how Lee's relationship ended. There were more important things right now. How could I enjoy eating and feasting while people were sleeping on the road? The cabbage merchant chuckled. If you keep thinking of the sadness in the world, then you will never be able to enjoy anything. I am just a human, so I can't solve the world's problems. But if I can help someone who seems in need of help in front of my eyes, then I see no problem with helping them. The words that came out of my mouth were bullshit. I would never risk my life or help someone if it wasn't at least a little beneficial to me. Life wasn't a charity, and I wasn't some saint that would go around helping everyone. But the cabbage merchant was different. I plan to make myself seem good enough in his eyes. This was something I needed for the deal that we will have later in my life. People like making deals with honest people more than those that seemed like they would backstab you. Plus, I wasn't the kind of guy who would stab someone in the back or betray them, maybe now. I don't like stabbing people in the back. But if the situation came where the benefits were overwhelmingly good with doing so, then I would probably do it. Who am I kidding? No, I would definitely do it. Getting up? I offered the cabbage merchant a hand. Wanna come and try some Earth Kingdom food? The meal is on me. He smiled and nodded taking my hand as I pulled him up. Well, if it's something unrelated to the cabbages, then I have no idea on what to make of my business. Suddenly, I got a new quest notification. Help the desperate cabbage merchant chain quest the cabbage merchant had fallen in hard times. Help him and he will remember this favor in the future. The more you help him, the better the more grateful he will be. The minimum requirement to complete the quest is to help him find shelter for the night. Completion reward. 1000 experience points. Increase closeness with the cabbage merchant chain quest. So it's something that will continue even after I complete this quest, then I will get another after it. This was an opportunity to help the cabbage merchant accomplish something big. I knew he had the talents, so no matter the investments it was almost 100% certain that he would make it big. 
Yumi stood at the peak of one of Amash's highest buildings. When he saw Aang, he could barely hide his excitement. But now, he had come down, and a smirk was apparent on his face. There were a thousand problems he had, and a thousand more would be added if he let the outside world influence him. The Earth Kingdom was losing the war, and quite terribly at that too. It was only a matter of time before Ba Sing Si and Amashu fell. Yumi could see that clearly. The people needed the avatar as a symbol to tile behind, and a great general to lead the army. Yumi's eyes wandered towards a young man helping a certain cabbage merchant fallen on hard times. Yumi's smirk turned into a full-blown smile. Hey, a general. Someone intelligent and cold enough to know when to make the right decision. I have just the man in mind. Back when they had met, Sokka had asked Yumi's age, and the old man's answer had been older than most of you, which had shown that he knew Aang's age. No one else would have caught it. But Bumi could see Sokka's intelligence shine through like a beckon. He had figured it out within an instant. What a scarily intelligent young man, muttered Bumi. If Sokka had been on the enemy's side that would be a problem. But now that he was an ally, the old king couldn't help but think of some tests he could put the young man through. Keka 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 ki Bumi's cackles rang through the night as he started jumping from building to building, returning to his palace. Things have just become so interesting. Katara and Arm stood in their prison room that was more like a luxurious hotel and looked around. There has got to be a way we can escape out of this, mumbled Arn, speaking his thoughts out loud. Even he could see that King Bumi was crazy, and didn't want to stay around and figure out what the crazy old man had planned for them. Arn, Katara sighed, a little tired. There was no way to escape the room. They had been searching for hours. Let's just go to sleep. She was feeling mostly worn out because of her brother's actions. Sokka had annoyed her a lot with his behavior. He always seemed to go around and do whatever he wanted, without thinking of the consequences. Sometimes to Katara, it felt like he had become a different person. But she knew that he was still her brother. Suddenly, the wound of the door opening rang out, and Sokka came in with a flushed face, and smelling full of alcohol. Hello everyone goodnight bomb. His face planted into the ground, and the sound of snoring. Katara clenched her fists and veins popped in her forehead. She wanted to punch her brother so hard that his brain would finally be set straight. But seeing his peaceful sleeping face, she sighed and picked up a blanket, throwing it over his body to help him sleep. Arn saw this and didn't say anything. He knew that they wouldn't be able to escape, and went to sleep in one of the couches. Katara slept on the bed. The only one awake was Momo, and he kept staring at the unconscious Sokka. The flying lemur tilted his head and made some soft cute noises. Sai suddenly Sokka sighed, and casually got up, staring at the flying lemur in the eyes. There was no look of drunkenness in his eyes, and he wasn't stumbling, showing that his actions before were all an act. For a weird cat and bat combination, you are quite smart. Sokka looked at Arn and Katara, using Observe to make sure that they were sleeping, and looking through the map, he also saw that no one was spying on them. After seeing that, he pulled out a spear out of his inventory and started practicing. He then took off his shirt that smelled of alcohol. Fwish. His spear cut through a dozen of his imaginary enemies and cut through the air like a whip. Hearing the sound, Sokka's swipes got softer, so he wouldn't wake up Arn and Katara. Still, each swipe of his spear cut through the air like a surgical knife. When morning came and Katara woke up, she saw that Sokka was washing his face in the sink at the corner of the room. She raised her hand ready to waterbend, and tried to freeze his face for a little to teach him a lesson. That was when Sokka suddenly stumbled and clenched his forehead. Ugh, he grunted. My head is killing me. She frowned and in the end stopped her plans and sighed, unable to bring herself to even jokingly hurt her brother. What she didn't notice was Sokka's smirk, as he had seen her through the mirror, and could guess that she was about to do something. So he played at her heartstrings and acted like he was sick. By the time they went to meet King Bumi again, Sokka was still holding his head and grunting to avoid Katara's judgment. But as soon as they entered the throne room, he straightened his back and looked completely normal. Katara noticed this and looked at him strangely. Sokka made a peace sign towards her. You snooze, you lose, sister. It was childish, totally childish. But Katara couldn't help herself as she finally caught on to what was happening. But it was too late because they were in the presence of a king, and she couldn't do anything now. Avatar. Yumi yelled out loud suddenly, making Aang flinch. I dash yeah Aang answered nervously. I have a challenge for you and your smart friend here. Bami's smile was so wide that it almost seemed to split his face. Sokka was surprised. He remembered that only Arn had been tested and challenged by Bumi during the series. He couldn't help but wonder what obstacles Bumi was going to throw at him. Bumi observed Sokka closely and smirked, seeing that the young man didn't show any sign of being surprised. Though Bumi was now used to him not even showing anything that he felt on the outside. This left the old king reassured that if someone tried to scheme against Arn, then he had someone who would be able to pull him out of it. Taking Sokka over to a special Colosseum-like platform, Yumi smiled as he saw the young man just curiously looking around, and seemingly wasn't worried about anything. The old king had to admit it. He was a little impressed by Sokka's fearless demeanor. But at the same time, such carelessness could lead to incompetence. Ash thought Yumi. 
clenching his fist and causing the ground below Sokka to crack, making him stumble. Within an instant, a pillar of rock shot out of the walls and towards his head. With only a slight and noticeable movement, Yumi had manipulated the earth to teach the young man that being careless wasn't a good idea, even when the enemy seemed friendly. Unexpectedly, Sokka moved like water, and even though the ground below him shook, his balance didn't, and he crouched down dodging the rock pillar. Rocks these days seem to fall strangely, Sokka said nonchalantly, smiling at Byumi, and walking past the still erect rock pillar. Don't you think so? Kakakakaka Byumi laughed crazily. He was amused. No, beyond amused. Ash Ang was very lucky to get a comrade like this. Even before I attacked he had sensed the danger. What monstrous instincts. What Byumi didn't know was that this was all due to Sokka's sense danger skill which at level 10, allowed him to sense danger a whole second before it happened. Of course, Sokka wasn't going to tell him that, but he also learned something else. He cannot tell what I am thinking or feeling by sensing the earth below him. Ash contemplated Sokka. Though never directly mentioned in the series, he believed the Bumi was like Toph, and could sense the earth vibrations with his feet. This ability gave the people who mastered it another ability, to sense when people were lying or not. That was why Sokka had been only telling half-truths and technical truths every time he talked with Bumi. But he didn't feel confident in this yet, and would have to make sure that it also worked on Toph too. He suspected that this was due to Gamma's body. What are you waiting for? Jump down. Yumi instructed him and pointed towards the middle of the Colosseum-like structure below them. Sokka sighed and jumped down. Though he and Yumi seemed to be alone, he had a sneaking suspicion that there were guards hidden in these walls. Well, it was a sneaking suspicion until he checked the map, which showed that yes, they were hiding in the walls. Fwish. Sokka jumped down gracefully, and due to his high agility, he looked like an airbender to the untrained eye. If you are going to have me fight, can you give me a weapon? No, Yumi denied his request. Sometimes you will be left stranded in enemy territory without a weapon. Let's see how you handle it. Sigh, Sokka sighed and shrugged. In the end, he wasn't going to reveal his inventory here, just to prove the old king wrong. Well, who is my challenger then? Challenger. You mean challenges right, said Bumi before he walked off and the earth around the Colosseum opened up and men in rags came through. They are armed and some amongst them seemed even like earthbenders. What Bumi was trying to teach Sokka here was that he needed a better charismatic charm. True, the young man was friendly and nice, just like your favorite waiter. But what Bumi was trying to make here wasn't a waiter, but a general. Bumi was quite sure that Sokka wouldn't be able to beat so many people. There were almost a hundred of them. So he either had to solve this by sweet talking or being born. The latter would teach him some humility, while the former would improve his charismatic abilities and test them to their limits. Unknown to Bumi, Sokka had a whole different plan. Instead of being shocked or scared of this, he was happy. 100 man challenge to feed 100 skilled warriors in one battle. Clear Bumi's challenge. Failing is a way of cleaning it too. Objectives. 1. Defeat 100 men too. Make them submit to you. Time limit. Before Bumi comes back. 3. Turn these men into worthy soldiers. Time limit. Before Bumi comes back. Rewards. For completing objective 1 dash, 100,000 experience points for completing objective 2, random egg for completing objective 3, Sky Piercer Spear Sokka was excited at this, and the malicious expression combined with his sharp eyes seemed to freak out the prisoners. Hey man, I just came here to get a better meal, but this guy seems scary. Yeah, look at that crazy look on his face, you don't fight with people like that, they will bring you to their level and beat you up down there. Shut up. Suddenly a muscular man that was two times the size of a normal human yelled out. He had a bald head and a muscular body. He didn't have any weapons on him, meaning that he was an earthbender. They were given the choice to get a weapon before coming here to fight, and mostly earthbenders didn't have a weapon as they didn't need it, and would just hinder them. You guys act like cowards. We are a hundred men. Let's beat this brat up within an inch of his life, and go back to eating the feast that we were promised if we beat him. Oh, I remember that guy. Wasn't he some scary general that committed too many war crimes? Yeah, his name was Kun, I think. With a guy like that on our side, then there is no way we are losing. Sokka on the other hand just stared at them, and wondered why no one had charged at him yet. After all, they were a hundred people, but then he realized that unlike in the stories, these prisoners weren't dumb. The first one to charge was bound to get beat up, but after that everyone else would get the bravery to attack. Sokka looked at the man with the highest level, and could see that it was the man who was monstrously huge. He used Observe on the man. Now that the skill was at level 20, it could show quite a bit of information. Kun, level 63 and imprisoned ex-general, dishonorably discharged for killing and torturing Fire Nation soldiers. He would keep his enemies' heads on pikes to scare them off, and would match with the heads on the battlefield. His earthbending is dangerous and start to kill his opponents. Seeing this, Sokka decided that he would be the first opponent he had to try and take out. Because as the fight went along, people like him only became more dangerous, 
and got used to their opponent's speed. Fwish. Soccer charged, not even leaving footprints on the ground as he ran, and it seemed like he was fleeting off the ground due to how fast he moved. This was how the untrained eye saw him. But Khan, who had been in the midst of war and dodged blasts of fire thrown at him, was on guard against the attack. Hey, you are pretty fast for a brat, snorted Khan, kicking on the ground, causing a pillar of earth to rise around Soccer, and the momentum pushed him in the air. I know how to deal with fast cats like you. Just put them in the air where they can't move. He then shot a couple of boulders at Soccer who was still mid-air. Anyone else would have panicked right now, as Khan's strategy was spot on. But unlike others, Sokka had Gamer's mind, and he was as calm as he would be while drinking a cup of tea. As the boulder was within arm's reach, he shifted his body mid-air, and used the rock and its momentum, kicking off it and propelling himself into the crows of other people. They immediately attacked him, but Sokka dodged all of the attacks, with only a hair's length away from hitting him. Hammer, spear, sword, and many other weapons swung at him, but Sokka dodged each of them. Even as boulders started raining down on him from the ceiling, as he had predicted Kun was being a problem, and had found a way to attack him without hitting his comrades. Seeing this, Sokka grabbed one of the spearmen, and used his body as a shield, and took his weapon away. After that, he quickly jumped off to the other side of the room, stabbed his spear in the wall, and dangled where no melee weapons could reach him. With a spear in hand, the atmosphere around Sokka changed completely, and the feeling of danger he radiated increased tenfold. Kunbo wasn't intimidated and shot a barrage of rocks at him. Sokka used all of the rocks to move and used them as platforms. Even while they were midair and in movement, Sokka was fast and agile enough to move faster. Within an instant, he was in front of the ex-general, who was his biggest problem here. Though he noticed another problem here and could see that Kun undoubtedly had a very rich combat experience as anywhere Sokka would use his spear to pierce the man would retaliate and attack at the same time. It would turn into an exchange of hits rather than Sokka attacking him. But at this time, the general who had been through a hundred battlefields, got attacked in a way that he hadn't predicted or ever experienced in the battlefield. Sokka threw the spear up, seemingly abandoning his weapon. He then softly hit Kun in some positions, but the giant man's body clenched for a split second before his kai stopped circulating, and he fell on the ground like a puppet with its strings cut off. Shh dash how, muttered the man before he entered deep unconsciousness. Sokka saw the boulders heading towards him as there were some more earthbenders in the midst, and he had to take care of them too. The spear that he had thrown in the air had come down, and he picked it up with precision. Hours passed and Arn completed his challenges, getting the lunchbox key, finding the king's pet, fighting Byumi, and even guessing his name. Yumi had threatened Arn with Sokka's life, well not directly, but insinuated that something bad would happen to their friend if the Avatar didn't finish his challenge quickly. As they were walking down the hallways towards Sokka, Arn couldn't help but ask, did Sokka get to do a challenge too? Yeah, King Yumi nodded and looked at Momo, narrowing his eyes. His challenge is connected to the 87th Sutra. Heart and soul looked through the eyes. There was an 87th. Arn wondered, what Yumi was speaking of was some monk text and he didn't remember being any sutra above the 20th. Oh, we are here, exclaimed Byumi excitedly. Even he couldn't wait to see how Sokka was going to finish his trial. Katara was behind the old friends, and she had a frown. Unlike Ahn, um, she hadn't forgotten just how worried she had been for Sokka. No sister should ever have to wonder if their brother was alive or dead. Suddenly an earthbender came out of the walls, and he had a shocked look and sweat running down his face, as if he had seen something straight out of a dream. My king something unexpected has happened. Yumi smiled excitedly and didn't wait for the soldier's report. Wanting to see the results himself, Arn followed along, and so did Katara. The soldier sulked and stared at the ground depressingly. He never listens to what I see. Why am I even working here? My dream was to be a nude artist. Suddenly he picked himself up and looked around breathing a sigh of relief when he saw that no one had heard that. But a strange sound interrupted him, and he looked down seeing Momo looking at him strangely, as if he understood what the man said. Please don't tell anyone, the soldier begged. When Bumi arrived at the Colosseum Arena, he saw something that shocked him. There was Sokka, and a hundred men were lined up perfectly with Kun on the lead. They were all on their knees and bowing towards Sokka. Hell the great leader. They all yelled out in unison. Their hands and knees shook due to how long they had had to hold that bowing position, but no one dared complain because they had seen what Sokka was able to do to convince them. I didn't hear you. Sokka reprimanded them, as scary look dominating his face, and the air around him felt colder. Hell the great leader Sokka Kekakekekeki Bumi's loud cackles interrupted the whole event, and everyone looked at him. Though no man boring down dared to get up, currently they were more afraid of Sokka than their king. How were you able to make those rough guys docile like that? Well, first I used a firm hand for discipline, and then a soothing palm to comfort them, Sokka said with a gentle smile on his face. One thought went through every man that was bowing down at that moment. Soothing hand when the hell did you use that dash all of them had the same thoughts. 
but didn't dare to voice them. Yumi laughed even louder, and Sokka smiled along with him as he got a new notification. Challenge quest completed you have completed objective 1. Plus 100,000 experience points you have completed objective 2. Random egg has been deposited in your inventory you have completed objective 4. The spear. Sky piercer has been deposited in your inventory you have leveled up you have leveled up you. Have leveled up you. Have leveled up you. Have reached level 30 your gamer interface gains a new function. He dismissed all of the notifications for the moment and planned to look at them later. Ash soccer POV. Yumi and Arm went on one last slide, and we set off a Mashu with a bag of money and rations. Yumi promised us an army if we ever went to war against the Fire Nation. As we left he gave me some advice which increased my wisdom by one point. It was good advice, and how I should become the mind and monster of the group when they need one. But the advice was nowhere near Iroh's level. That guy would give me a wisdom point every time we spoke. As Appa set off and flew into the sky, we departed from Amashu, and I gave one last look towards the city. Now it was the time I had been anticipating. Time to check my quest rewards and what I had gotten. The first thing that Sokka checked was the new weapon. He didn't pull the spear out of the inventory but just looked at its stats. Skypiercer a legendary spear used by Lubu, a legendary general that was thought to be undefeated in combat. It can change form and will always perfectly fit the user. Plus 500% spear mastery skill experience points plus 40 agility plus 50 strength Lubu. Isn't that from Liney's history? Ash thought Sokka, he was a little down as he didn't know a lot about Chinese history or mythology. Though the name sounded familiar and the spear had amazing boosts. Plus, it was perfectly suited for him, as it would help with his spear mastery too. With this and the title he had on, spear mastery would have a 1,500% increase in experience points gain. If he trained for a year with the spear, it would be the same as if he had trained 15 years with it. With the gamer interface, that would be a crazy combination. Sokka attributed it to his luck for making such a reward available for him. It was just too perfectly suited. He then checked his next reward. It was the random egg, and it had a description below it. That said it would summon a pet based on the user's luck. Sokka left that for later as currently, he was on top of Appa. He had good luck, so while normally this egg might summon a normal cat or chicken. But now he knew that with his luck, it might be a dragon or something. He couldn't explain that to Aang or Katara, so he decided to use the egg when he is alone. While random rewards to others wouldn't offer anything, to Sokka it was the reward he would like the most. Anything based on luck, he would win big. Checking his new addition to the gamer interface, Sokka was shocked by what he saw. Welcome to the gotcha interface each time you level up, you get one free draw ticket you can roll randomly once. Or you can roll 10 times consecutively in the information Gacha Sokka noticed that there were two gotcha ways to roll. One of them was the normal roll, which was a random skill, item, or anything for that matter. But the other roll was for information, the one free roll per level could roll the information gotcha 10 times at once. So the conversation was one normal roll equals 10 information rolls. This was a little different from the normal gotcha that Sokka was used to. He had to try hard to keep his smile down, because while this might be something that would infuriate others, with his luck, this was pretty much a guaranteed win each time. With that in mind, Sokka added all of the new stats points that he had gotten into luck, and rolled for the random gacha first. A translucent roulette started spinning, and mid-spin items started being added to it. So it seemed random. Due to this being the first roll, chances of getting a better item will be increased. This privilege will be terminated after the first roll the roulette landed in a red gem. The item has been added to your inventory. Looking at his inventory and selecting the red gem he was shocked. He expected himself to be lucky, but not this lucky. Philosopher's Stone a red ruby that seemed like blood crystallized. It is a legendary item that has been created by the mightiest alchemist. The item itself borders on divine intervention, being the closest thing to God. This is the end game kind of item. This is like finding the holy sword that can beat the demon king, with one slash into the tutorial stage. Ash thought soccer. While the reward was something so good, he didn't know what to do with it. How do you even use a Philosopher's Stone? For now, he decided to dismiss it and think about the stone later. Sokka had 29 more draws, and decided to spend one point in the information section of the gotcha. With one roll point, he could roll 10 times at once. Demimist is Zabuza Momochi. Zabuza Momochi has killed Gato, and taken his wealth to help the Hidden Mist Village. Zabuza Momochi feels indebted to you and you can use this against him. Lao Ji is the earthbender who has discovered immortality. Lao Ji is located in Ba Sing Si, acting as a homeless man, and will be there for two more years. Location marked in map Lao Ji is looking for a worthy disciple, just like he did with Avatar Kaishi. The cursed spirit spear is hidden in the spirit world. Location marked in map, the cursed spirit spear is considered the strongest in the world. While strong spear has a thousand evil spirits sealed in it, anyone who has touched it has gone crazy. The biggest oil reserves in the world lay on the South Pole. Marked on map Sokka just stared at the screen. Katara noticed her brother had a dead fish look in his eyes, and went to him worryingly. 
Soccer, is there something wrong? Noah's small smoke came to him first. The look on his face almost seemed malicious, and it made Katara get chills down her spine. But within a split second his looks returned to normal. He gently looked at her, and his smile returned to being soft and sincere. Dear sister, was that my mind playing tricks on me? Ash wondered Katara. In the end, she dismissed such thoughts. After some time, Appa had to finally take a break. Sokka entered his zone and went to the river, catching three fish in less than a minute. Arm was a vegetarian, so he would go and find some fruits for himself. Can't believe you became so good at fishing. Though Katara wouldn't admit it out loud. She was surprised by just how good Sokka was becoming at everything. My good looking face must have attracted them. He smiled smugly. Though it was mostly a combination of his fishing skill and luck stats. Fwish. Katara throws a ball of water in annoyance to dose her brother with a dose of reality. But he seemingly dodged as if he had eyes in the back of his head. He looked at his sister, and his smug look was ten times worse now. Ah, uh, I might be such a genius that even my sister is jealous of me. His sing-song voice seemed to get on Katara's nerves even more. She started throwing water balls at him, though they wouldn't do any damage. They were sure to soak him. Bai Sokka seemed to easily dodge them even when she decided to break the water balls close to him to create a splash. Yet, no droplet of water seemed to touch him. Ah ha ha am I some kind of genius seen once in a thousand years? Sokka said dramatically, looking at the heavens. Get to cooking if you have time to play around. Katara yelled at him, and her brother went and did that. He seemed to be good enough at cutting the fish without even looking at it. Instead, he kept staring at Katara with a smile on his face. Have I ever told you that you are pretty? Huh? Where the hell did that come from? Yeah, I can see how we are related. When you have a handsome brother as you do, then there is no way you will turn ugly. Their arguments continued until Un came back and the avatar looked around and saw that the ground was very wet, as if a waterbender had been throwing a tantrum. Katara was pouting to the side while Sokka was trying to appease her by giving her some fish. Sorry about saying that you will become fat from eating fish. Arn's teachings as a monk would always help pacify situations, but he knew better than to interfere in a sibling bickering situation, because he would end with both Sokka and Katara being mad at him. It was strange because in one instance they might be fighting between themselves, but as soon as someone else interfered, or tried to pacify them, they would turn their anger towards the person. Bam suddenly. The ground shook and a loud noise came from afar. Sokka and Katara stopped their arguing and looked towards the forest where the sound came from. Bam. 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 Suddenly the sound of rocking became even louder. Katara and Arn went to chase after it and see what it was. But Sokka didn't move, and as he saw them running off, he breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, alone. Appa and Momo had chased after Aang too. So this gave Sokka a chance to finally do what he had waited for until he was alone. Random egg and egg the size of his head appeared on his hand, and Sokka went to open it. Hoping that luck would be on his side again. As Sokka held the random egg in his hands, a notification appeared in front of his eyes. Do you want to hatch the random egg? Yes slash slash no the choice was obvious and the eggshell started peeling away, and slowly a red fox's head peeked through. Though the fox was cute and looked very fluffy, rubbing its head against Sokka's hand, many others would be charmed by the fox and its cuteness, but he just grabbed the little creature by the back of its neck and brought it close to his face. The fox shook in fear as it saw Sokka's cold eyes. You aren't just a normal fox, right? Because that would be bad for you. The little fox immediately shook its head in denial, trying to show that it wasn't weak. Good, good, Sokka smiled. Because I never tasted fox soup, and I was kinda getting tired of fish. The fox looked on fearfully, and it made cute noises. Sokka though was like a Buddha, and his heart stood firm. You better be some secretly strong guy or else Katara, and Arm followed the young earthbender. That was causing all of that noise back to his residence, which was a store with a woman handling the counter. As they approved, they heard him speaking with his mother. At first, Katara and Arn are about to interfere when they suddenly feel someone grab their shoulders. Turning around, they see Sokka who now had a fox on his shoulder. The new animal companion that he had surprised them a little. But by now they were used to Sokka doing weird things. And him getting a little fox as a pet in the middle of the forest wasn't that strange. Here you are my stupid little sister and friend. Did you ever stop and think that this might be a dangerous situation? Sokka questioned them with a scary smile on his face. He didn't need them to start interfering in things like these. What Un needed to be wasn't some brat sticking his nose into other people's business. But he must be seen as the avatar. Such a simple exchange would make the situation much easier. And Sokka was willing to get himself involved here too. As it would help him get some more soldiers for when the fateful day comes. These earthbenders would know the tyranny of the Fire Nation and would fight fiercely in war. And Sokka knew a lot of ways on how to rile these people up. After all, he knew some of the speeches from the greatest leaders in his past life and was ready to use that which would be a fresh and new speech in this world and not copied from anyone. Getting up, Sokka took a deep breath and put the cute fox atop his head to make himself seem as harmless as could be. With that, he opened the shop door. Excuse me. 
are there any earthbenders here? And Dash no said the mother, scared that her son might have been caught. Even Harris seemed scared. He had met Armin Katara already, and they had seen him earthbend. That could have made them report it to the Fire Nation officials here. Ah, sorry if I seem suspicious. Sokka spoke, his voice, face, and demeanor seemed very harmless. Though Haro and his mother still kept their guard up, unconsciously they were starting to see Sokka as harmless. I am here to gather forces into the resistance to fight against our Fire Nation tyrants. Haro felt a sense of excitement at those words. But he stopped himself and cautiously thought. Asher resistance movement. I never heard of it. This could all be a ruse, better be careful. Apostrophe ha 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 don't worry. We aren't here to cause trouble. We will release the prisoners first, and then talk later, Sokka declared confidently. It almost made Haru and his mother want to believe him, but they knew that fighting against the Fire Nation was useless. Even if they defeated them today, new forces would come in tomorrow. But this was all within Sokka's predictions, as he decided to give the final nail in the coffin. Also, haven't I already mentioned we have the Avatar? Sokka pulled on and brought the young boy next to him. The Ebender fidgeted nervously. He had heard Sokka's grandiose speech but wasn't sure he could deliver those kinds of promises. But Arm did as he was naturally thought to do by the monks, and that was to be nice. Hi everybody, how is your day going? Immediately, Sokka's smile slipped off his face and grabbed Arm by the back of his clothes, and easily lifted him like a cat. Well, leave the speeches to me from now on. With that, Sokka went into what he would call politician mode, and made many extremely vague promises, but still within the realm of possibility. Would he keep those promises? Well, it depended on how convenient it was to keep them. By the end of it, after he finished his speech, everyone except Katara was pumped up. She could see through her brother, and he was up to something. Though she didn't know what yet. Anyway, now I will go and get captured. Ahn, remember your part in the plan. And with that Sokka threw the little fox at Katara. She barely caught it, and its owner ran off. Wait, I had a part in the plan. Ahn was very confused. He looked at Sokka and saw him giving a confident thumbs up. Good, use that confusion. It will help, Sokka remarked, as he went and found a Fire Nation soldier, and did something that shocked Haru, his mother, Katara, and Ahn. He just went and punched the soldier in the face. A bending punch. Bam. The soldier was knocked down and grasped at his nose, as blood dripped out of his nose and sipped out of his fingers, painting the ground red. He shot a victorious smile and declared, The Fire Nation will bow towards my earthbending. Soon he was surrounded by Fire Nation soldiers, and quietly captured and ready to be shipped off to the prison rig offshore. Katara and Arn were left confused. None of them knew what the plan was or what to do in this situation. Honestly, while Sokka had spoken big words, none of them quite understood what he had said. Ash Sokka POVR, the method of saying a thousand words, but meaning nothing. This was something I had mastered in my past life, as it was a useful social skill to have. Also, I had a literal skill that helped me with this. Left bracket level 54, makes you better at acting. Sometimes even people close to you can't tell the changes you go through. This was my highest level skill that wasn't max level, so it said a lot about me. Even my spear mastery was nowhere near close to it. As I was dragged away by the soldiers, I looked at their red uniforms and tried to memorize each detail of it, and even how they were worn. Also, during canon, the group wasted a lot of time here. And I didn't want that. Instead of sleeping a night here and having Katara pretend to be an earthbender to get captured, I just needed to punch a guy. So, is it in your job resume that you guys have to act like villains? I asked trying to instigate a little chaos in their midst. When things became heated up, or the soldiers started thinking for themselves, it would plant a seed of doubt if their actions were right. Shut up, you Earth Kingdom scum. As expected, they won't kill me. After all, how else would they be able to keep the population suppressed? I doubt the Fire Nation wanted to fight a war on all fronts, so instead, they have colonized places and tried to keep the people they capture hostage to make the citizens helpless. The earthbending thing was mostly a ruse to give the people hope. Not a bad strategy, but very poorly executed. As Sokka went through the checking and was imported to the prison, he was talking with Zabuza on the intercom the whole time. Miss Demon, I must thank you for the advice. It helped me a lot. E-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Really? Miss Demon. Yeah, now I am liberated from the laws, and the whole world treats me as a criminal. What's the use of trying to stay within the contract now? B-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Well, that's nice. I just punched a guard from the enemy nation, and am now in prison. The messages between them weren't anything that would reveal too much about the other. But Zabuza had slowly but surely come to trust the person on the other side. That had been Sokka's intention. Though he didn't know if he could learn Jutsu from the Naruto world. He had to at least try. After all, MP wasn't called Kai. But he could use it as Kai. All the same, to fuel both his waterbending and many other techniques. Also, Sokka was being careful here and not inviting anyone else in the chat room, even though he could now invite someone else too. Since he had reached level 30. This is your new home for the rest of your life, scum. One of the guards snorted, pushing Sokka and where the rest of the earthbenders were staying. Sokka walked casually as the rest of the men looked at him with suspicious looks at first. 
But as soon as the guard went away, an old man with a white beard came forward, a gentle smile accompanying his lips. He had falling hair and seemed like a grandpa. Young man, why did someone like you come here? Were you reckless and got caught too? This should be Tyro, Harry's father. Ash analyzed Sokka, before a smile came to his face, and he offered the old man his hand. Tyro took the handshake. My name is Sokka, from the Southern Water Tribe, and I am here to free you all. I am Tyro, he introduced himself and signed. But none of us can escape here. There is nothing to bend with. Sokka narrowed his eyes, able to see that what the men around here missed wasn't just Earth to bend. But the will to rise against their oppressors was nowhere to be seen either. This made Sokka sigh, as he walked towards and crackled his neck. He took a deep breath, and his lungs expanded unnaturally in size. Everyone a loud sound permeated through the prison, and Tyro, who was close to Sokka, winced as he had been the one most affected by the noise. He went towards him and tried to stop anything from happening to a boy that was the same age as his son. Young man, this isn't Dash. Are you cowards? Sokka yelled. This time the guards opened the door and came in with weapons. There were some firebenders amongst them too. What the hell is going on here? Asked the warden, a strict looking man with a small grey moustache and similarly grey falling hair. He looked at Sokka and clenched his teeth and in anger pointed at him. Are you the one who screamed so loud? Yes, Sokka smiled, his eyes turned sharp, and a sense of maliciousness was hidden within them, like a wolf looking at its prey. It wasn't the sense of someone arrogant, no, this was the confidence that he could kill the man in front of him. That terrified the warden as he could instinctively feel the danger, he was never used to such sharp looks before. But he composed himself quickly. There is nothing to be afraid of, he is surrounded, and the rest of the prisoner's spirits are too broken to fight. Those were the words the warden used to try and calm himself down. The danger he was feeling seemed almost unnatural to be produced by a human. Sokka also creepily smirked at the warden and stared him down like a wild beast. Ash Sokka POV. If your opponent is afraid of you, then half the battle is already over. After all, a man who was openly scared would pose a pathetic figure and wouldn't ever be able to gather courage from his men once the battle went haywire. Do you want your children to live out in fear? I yelled out some second-rate cringy lines. Even though I felt embarrassed saying this, thanks to Gamer's mind, I was able to easily keep calm and not cringe. Do you want your wives to always worry and be stolen by the Fire Nation scum? Do you want them to be raped? That was when the men finally gained cold looks in their eyes. Good. Demonizing the enemy, making it seem like they are after you, not your country, but you personally, then it would make the situation a whole lot more bearable. Make the enemy a monster who will kill their children and rape their wives and daughters. Everyone's muscles flinched and like med beasts even without earthbending, they charged forward. The warden tried to scamper back and run away. But sadly for him, I was here. Putting a hand in my pocket as if to take out a hidden weapon, I pulled out a knife and threw it. Due to my high agility, the knife flew through the air with impeccable precision and pierced the back of the warden's knee. Okay? I didn't have that good of a skill even with high agility. So this was all luck. Ah. The warden yelled out in pain as he stumbled and slammed on the hard metal floor, knocking out a couple of his teeth. Through a gritted jaw, he yelled out, Revolt! Guards, I casually walked towards the warden as his guards were beaten to a bloody pulp by the earthbenders. Their children being killed and their wives raped. No man would be able to handle that kind of emotion, and they would embody the best that they always keep under control. Especially warriors like them, who were used to having bending power. The earthbenders' eyes turned towards the downed warden, and they walked forward, ready to rip the man apart. But I stopped them by crouching down in front of the warden and pulling the knife out of the back of his knee mercilessly. He whimpered tears coming out of his eyes. The same knife was drawn towards his throat and ready to slit it. Please, please spare me. The warden begged, tears and snot coming out of him as he stared at me fearfully. I won't kill you. As soon as he heard that, his face lit up in a disgusting smile. But that quickly died down once my knife got closer, touching his skin and drawing a line of blood on his throat. As long as you do what I say, then I won't kill you. After telling that to the man, I grabbed him by the hair and raised him up and turned him around to face the gates. My knife stood at his throat all the time. If you don't open the gates in three seconds, I will slit your dear warden's throat. As I said that, I was careful about the brutality of my words, but seeing the earthbenders still wear out for blood, I felt relieved. It meant that they were still drunk in victory and would do anything I said as long as victory was delivered to them. Kind of like when Hitler told the Nazis to do horrible things. They were so high in their sense of superiority and how Hitler had filled their minds with a groundless sense of supremacy that they forgot the people they were persecuting were also humans. Okay? That was a horrible analogy. But the point still stood. Both sides were seeing each other as monsters, and right now, it was good. Because this was a time of war and not one where people must heal. That will come after if this war ends in our favor. If we win, I will have to make sure to create a time of healing between the sides. Damn why does war have to be so complicated? Sokka looked towards the door and started counting. Three, two. With each number the knife started digging more and more into the warden's neck. 
On dash you bastards open the door, yelled out the warden, and the exit to where the earthbenders were kept opened. Sokka hit the warden with the butt of his knock on the back of his head, and blacked the man out, as his head swished too forward, and his face planted into the ground. Did I hit him too hard? Ash wondered Sokka. Well, it doesn't matter either way if that guy dies or not. With that in mind, he raised his bloody knife to the air and yelled, Men, let's take destiny into our own hands today. The roar was like that of a merciless beast, and the earthbenders charged, stomping on the down warden. What no one else seemed to notice was that due to the stampede, the warden was squashed to death, and had met a brutal end. Sokka noticed this but didn't say anything. Instead, he was using his sense danger skill to dodge fireballs and catch arrows mid-air as he led the charge against the prison. The Fire Nation soldiers were fighting hard, with their leader already down. They were disheartened. After all, even if they somehow won, what were they going to do? No one knew anything, and Sokka took advantage of the confusion mercilessly, throwing his knife at a soldier with a spear, and picking up his weapon. As soon as he had a weapon at hand, he jumped up into mid-battle, and due to the sun obstructing their view, no one noticed his weapon changing. Even those who did, would at worst think that their eyes were playing tricks on them. He had equipped the spear which increased his stats by 50 strength and 40 agility. Essentially, with this boat, he became an unbeatable monster on the battlefield. He mercilessly cut up Fire Nation soldiers without mercy. Unlike how many people might contemplate killing others and how it was wrong, Sokka didn't care. They were endangering his life, he wasn't foolish enough to go easy on an enemy who was ready for all intents and purposes to kill him. Suddenly, a squad of firebenders formed and shot an array of fire at Sokka who swung his spear, creating a swish of wind that pushed the fire upward. Then with a step that made his foot dent the metal floor below him, Sokka entered a spearmanship stance, and the atmosphere around him turned into that of a deadly martial beast. By now, every Fire Nation soldier had one thought in mind. We cannot beat him that was the daunting reality that dawned on them, and that was when a sense of utter despair surrounded their hearts. The soldiers and guards didn't want to die. They too had families and children, wives, parents, and siblings waiting for them. No one wanted to die. The single thought of survival and sense of pure despair made the Fire Nation soldiers see no way of winning this fight. Maybe if they had continued fighting, they would have had a chance to defeat Sokka as they were in familiar territory while he wasn't. But in their minds, the battle was already over. There was nothing to fight against as the pig couldn't war against the butcher. When Sokka saw this, he at first contemplated going and killing all of the people here. It would send a message and uproot anyone who dared to fight against him. But in the end, he decided against it as doing that would only bring trouble. And that would also add some tension in the group. Sokka knew that Kata would stay by his side no matter what. Because that was what family does. But An's pacifistic nature might get twisted. All of these thoughts went through his mind in a split second. And just as he was about to decapitate a soldier who had fallen on the ground. Sokka twirled his spear and pierced the metal below him. Clang. With that, the battle became as quiet as a ghost town. And the earthbenders couldn't believe that they had won even without their bending. Sokka looked everyone in the eye like a false tiger. Everyone. The battle is won. Is this reality or a dream? No way we won without bending. Some earthbenders dropped to their knees as tears came out of their eyes. Looking at their hands, the men felt a sense of freedom and elected joy rise within their hearts. Sokka smiled at this, and then looked back towards the Fire Nation. For one side he had become a demon, and for the other, he had become a saint. Two sides to the same coin. Sighing, he lifted his spear in victory. This kind of victory would have been impossible without some of his skills, even though Sokka had not a lot of battle experience. Skills like Danger Sense could replace that and fill the gap. In the end, the Fire Nation soldiers were imprisoned and the corpses were burned into the coal factories. Sokka personally made sure to collect any personal belongings of the enemy soldiers that had died and ordered the ones who had lived to return these things to the deceased families. He needed to get a head start on the process of healing. While he won't spare anyone who got in his way, Sokka didn't need to disillusion himself and demonize the enemy needlessly. They were human too, and he understood that humans held grudges. He also knew that the ceremonial service he was doing was mostly so the families of the people he kills won't come after him for revenge. Night settled over the water, but the prison was brimming with light, which surprised Arn and Katara. By the time they came flying on Appa, everything was over, and the whole situation had settled. What happened here? Asked Arn. And as they got closer they got a clearer look, and saw Sokka sitting on the ground as the head of a group of prisoners in rags. Though some were thin, some seemed sick and old, while everyone seemed like starving homeless people. There was a sense of joy amongst the people, as they laughed amongst each other. Arm was the first to understand what the people were feeling. Hope, he muttered. What? Asked Katara. They had made a plan to come and rescue Sokka. But it seemed like the whole ordeal was not needed. Her brother had taken care of things himself. This has become a trend in recent times. He always seemed to solve his problems by himself. But seeing him smile so genuinely and laugh with other people made her happy. 
Having noticed them, Sokka waved at Katara and Aang. Hey come here and let's enjoy a feast, guys. Guys. Do I look like a guy to you? Katara pouted while walking towards her brother. Both of the siblings knew that she was just acting annoyed, and there wasn't any outrage to her words. But still, that was enough to start a banter between them. Aang, having already seen this coming, did the one thing he considered sane and went along the fest, and picked the vegetables while introducing himself. Hi, I am Avatar Aang. Call me just Aang please. Though Aang was sometimes perturbed by Sokka's strange actions, he couldn't help but smile at having such a friend. He had been very lucky this time. Ash Sokka, thanks for being my friend and helping me. Ash Sokka POV. Did Aang start swinging for the other team? Why is he looking at me like that and smiling? Hopefully, I didn't change things that much deciding to stash these thoughts at the back of my head. I no longer thought about them, and instead was writing in the dimensional chat. While the feast was happening, I was communicating with Zabuza and freely giving him information about my world. This way he would come to his conclusion that we were from different worlds. If I told him directly, he wouldn't believe me and ask how I knew about it, since he hadn't revealed any information about himself. Instead, letting him figure it out would be the safer option. After that, he could open up about himself more. Once he knows that from another world, I couldn't do anything to him. If this worked out, then we can start talking about Jutsu, and he could maybe send some over. By that, I meant sending a copy-paste scroll on the chat by writing it himself. Then I copy the scroll in this world and try to see if it will turn into a skill book. This will be a long-term goal that will probably take a lot of time to accomplish. But it was better than nothing. The gamer interface was trapped within the limits of this world, though it can push those to a ridiculous degree. The confinement will still stand. But if I could get in contact with another world's skills, then the whole ordeal changes. Just imagining it made my heart race and got my blood pumping. Soccer, thank you for saving my father. Young man, if you need help, don't forget to call us. When this is all over, let's get a drink. Sokka smiled at the people waving at them as he, Aang, and Katara were on Appa. He had freed the people and given them the will to keep fighting even in a desperate situation. Now, even if they were in a desperate situation where bending was unavailable, these people wouldn't give up. These people that had once had their will and pride broken, now had unbreakable willpower. Sokka waved at the people and smiled. Let's get some drinks together when this is all over. The men who he had freed looked at him with surprise before they all smiled. Haru's father, the man who was the leader of the Earthbenders, came forward and clasped his hands in respect. Sokka, this village will never forget what you have done. If you ever need help, don't forget to call us. Sokka nodded, a small smirk on his face as Appa's tail swiped off the ground, and with an order from Aan, it glazed into the air. One day, soon, you guys will be called to war. So don't forget what I have done for you today. Dash thought Sokka, before he turned around and gazed at the clouds. Just a little bit more Aan and the rest of the crew were flying on Appa's back when they noticed something strange below them. It was like a dark scar in one of the mountains. But looking closer, one could see that it was just a burned forest. The beautiful trees that surrounded the burned site only brought to the surface. Just how beautiful of a place it could have been. Should we visit that place? Aang asked Sokka, who was now the unofficial leader of the group. By now, Aang knew that he couldn't act recklessly, so he had to have Sokka's help with these things. The oldest amongst them knew how to handle these things, and never did things that would be unnecessarily dangerous. Yes, Sokka nodded. Let's go down there. If it's nothing of note we can quickly get back on Appa if everything is okay. In reality, Sokka remembered this incident as well, and how a spirit would appear. So he didn't plan to interfere too much. But, he wanted to try and use this to enter the spirit world. Recently he got information through the gotcha that there was a cursed spear that would turn their user mad in the spirit world. Raising stats naturally would be hard as he didn't have a place with time dilation. Also he didn't have time to train stats as the return was not worth it. Rather, if he trained his skills, it would have better returns and fighting power. Maybe after this war was over, he could train his stats. But right now, the best he could hope was that his stats increased while he was training his skills. Having a strong item could temporarily cover that weakness, at least until the war is over. The Skypiercer Spear was good, but Sokka hoped that the Cursed Spear was better, since it had such an elaborate description. Due to planning ahead, intelligence increased by two Sokka dismissed the notification as Appa landed on the ground. His haze was like that of a hawk as he observed everything around. A burned forest? This isn't anything too big in my last world. But Arn will probably blame himself for it. He always assumed too many duties as the Avatar. Ash pondered Sokka, and just as he predicted, Arn blamed himself for all of this. Katara reassured the young man that the forest would grow again and pointed towards the acorns on the ground. Sokka ignored all of this and just looked around with sharp eyes. 
Someone was looking at them. Well, he was looking through the map and saw that it was a spirit. Heart-eating Willow Tree Soccer clenched his teeth at that because this was something that hadn't happened in the original timeline. So it meant that it was caused by him. He glanced towards the tree for a split second as if acting like he was looking at the forest and saw that a beautiful blossoming Sakura tree on the other side of the mountain had question marks as levels and it was recognized as a living and intelligent being. If it was anyone else they would hide and run away from the monster. But Sokka had other ideas. Right now, when together with his Spear Sky Piercer, then his stats would rise tremendously and become able to fight someone way past his level. Excuse me, are you the Avatar? An old man with the top of his head bald and the rest of his hair grey approached the group as he cautiously and nervously walked through the burned forest. It was as if he was afraid of what might come out. The man rubbed his long grey neck bit as he ogled on. Before Un could answer he jumped off Appa and told the rest of the group, Um, I have something to take care of. I will be back in a bit. Sokka stared at the cute fox in Katara's arms, and it looked away from his gaze as it buried its head in his sister's clothes. Also, little fox protect Katara. With that said, he immediately dashed off into an unburned part of the forest, leaving Un to deal on his own with what the villagers seemed worried about. Sokka jumped from tree to tree as he pulled out Sky Piercer from his inventory, which increased his agility another fold. From now on, it entered the stage of a supernatural speed, and no normal human I would be able to catch his movements. He blitzed through like a shadow, and within a split second, he was in front of the beautiful Sakura tree. A naked green head woman, her body firm, soft and beautiful with jade-like skin, she stood at the root of the tree, and looked at him seductively. Sokka's heart skipped a beat, this was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, and she didn't have any imperfections in her body. Everything about her was attractive, a strong warrior without bending. Just the kind I like, said the woman, smiling at him and endearing him a gesture. Sokka's eyes turned dull, and he walked towards the woman, his body seemed relaxed, and his spear was just about to slip out of his hand. Beautiful, he muttered. The woman's smile twitched as she stood up, her green hair barely covering just the best bits of her body. As soon as Sokka got close, drool dripped out of his mouth, and he extended his hand. Yes, come to me, screamed the woman lustfully. Just as their hands were about to touch, the sound of air being cut rung out. The woman's eyes widened as her body disappeared as she yelled. You tricked me, fwish. Sokka had an annoyed look on his face. The foolish and lustful look from before gone as if it wasn't there to begin with. ECH. I thought I would be able to get you with that. Clang. A branch of the Sakura tree had moved like a snake and blocked his spear. Though the branch looked brittle, as if it could break easily. That was far from the truth, as even though Sokka had used all of his strength on that slash, it was easily blocked by the tree. Ash Sokka POV. My hands shook as the tree branch moved as if it had a mind of its own. This tree spirit was probably around the same level as a Nagi, but it has a smaller body, and all the power is compressed. Even from the beginning, I knew that being female was just an illusion, because it didn't have a level or name above its head, but the tree did. Also, no simple mind manipulation technique worked on me, so whatever she tried to do failed. Inagi was just a big target, but this tree was different. It had no blood either, and even though I had tried to pull the water out of it, that didn't work. Which meant that the tree wasn't simple, it had to be a spirit tree. With that in mind, I abandoned the power behind my attacks, and tried to cut the main trunk of the tree with three fast slashes. Clang, clang, clang. The sound of metal clashing rang out as my attack was easily stopped. Three vines that were like whips breaking through the sound barrier attacked me, and I was barely able to dodge. Most of it was thanks to my sense danger skill, but even then, the speed was extremely high, and I knew that if I was hit with even one of those vines, then I would die. But, at the same time, the vines couldn't go past a certain point as I had calculated the rough trajectory of their attacks and moved half a step back from it. Fwish. Suddenly, the tree shifted slightly, but I had expected this. As the branches extended past their limit, planning for unexpected things like this was simple. Still, though, I wouldn't be able to escape the attack unless I used my spear to block it and then let go of Sky Piercer. But that would result in my death if I did that. But this battle was one of speed, and even thinking would be hard, so my body mostly moved on instinct. As another gentle looking vine came towards me, I used the spear to block and stood my ground even as the vine twisted and left a large gash on my chest. The vine had twisted like a whip and went way past its calculable limit. Looking at its roots, I saw that it had uprooted itself and used its roots as legs to move around. Oh, this was bad, very bad. I clutched at my chest, and even though my wound was gone, the blood that had splattered on the ground was still there. Also even with such a small graze, I had lost one slash tenth of my health points. Taking a deep breath, a sweet smell entered my nostrils, and immediately my eyes widened as I got another notification. You are under the negative effects of Pink Poison Strength decrease by 10, Agility decrease by 10, Endurance decrease by 10, 1 health points per second will be taken as damage, as long as the poison is in effect well. This just got worse. That was when I got another notification. You have got a new quest. 
The heart-eating spirit survive against the spirit. The heart-eating tree is a dangerous evil spirit that many people fear. Try and survive in any way possible. Rewards. Unknown unknown failure. Death by the heart spirit tree now. This was an interesting development of a scenario. There was no way I would be able to survive this onslaught head on. And if I tried running away, then I would die as soon as my back was turned. I was strangely calm even for being in a situation where I could die. Well, Gamer's mind was wonderful in keeping me serene and not letting me panic. Once again, a dozen vines extended towards me, and I knew that trying to cut or block them with my spear wouldn't lead me anywhere and would just be a death wish. Even though the situation was very dire, Sokka wasn't that worried. Panicking about such things would lead him nowhere. So instead, at this time he used the mightiest stat he had. Unlike what he usually showed with his overwhelming speed, many people would assume that Sokka's strongest trait was his agility. But that wasn't true, as his strongest trait was his luck. Gacha activated rolling random Gacha you have gained skill card. The power to gargle water and shoot out fireballs. Immediately, Sokka summoned the card out of his inventory and into his hand activating the item's effect. For 5 minutes, you have gained the ability to gargle water and shoot fireballs. Due to being from a different world, the ability is weakened by the world. Does the luck stats even work? Dash wondered Sokka, a little annoyed at getting such a bad ability. But he was okay as he had 27 more gotcha rolls. So he could get something useful by the next draw most likely. ECH, luck, what a shitty stat. Though, in that split second, he thought of how to use his new temporary skill. And got an idea. Suddenly a smirk came to his face. If this works out, luck, you are the best amongst the stats. The gamer interface didn't respond as it didn't have AI intelligence. But the spirit tree was confused as Sokka spoke to himself. Did you finally go mad? Spoke the spirit tree. Its voice was rumbling, like that of a crashing building. Has the feeling of death being so close finally knocked some sense in your head? Huh? Sokka looked at her confused. The hell are you talking about? I just figured out a way to beat you. He swiped his hand and the forest around him immediately dried up as the trees, leaves, and even grass had all of the water inside of them drawn out. Sokka used some of the water and turned it into water spikes, throwing it at the tree. But it was able to easily break the ice, and even seemed to grow a little bigger and stronger. As expected, muttered Sokka. Waterbending at this level was useless against it. As water flew towards him, the tree swiped its vines at incredible speeds. But with his danger sense Sokka had jumped back. He knew that even with the skill, if he got in close range, sensing the danger was useless if he couldn't dodge it. He manipulated the water down his throat and gurgled it. Suddenly a heat rose up his throat. It wasn't too hot, just enough to make his throat comfortably warm. Spew. Sokka shot out a fireball like a bullet out of his mouth. Damn it yelled the tree as it sensed the danger. Its vines all moved at one and formed a giant shield just to stop a small fireball. Boovroom the explosion that happened surprised even Sokka. As he was pushed back from the aftermath and crashed into a tree. He looked in surprise as the dust cleared up and a charred, barely alive tree stood there. No longer did the Sakura tree have its beauty, and by the dark ash covering, it seemed more like a cursed tree. Suddenly Sokka started making sense of the whole situation. Oh, I get it now. Not only are you weak to fire due to being made of wood, but even the poison that your vines produce is very flammable. The tree didn't say anything, nor did it move. Sokka chuckled. I was right on that one it seemed like. Also, the reason you didn't dare fight the firebenders was because of this too, right? Young man, don't assume to know more than you actually do spoke the half-dead tree. Its voice was raspy as if it had been drained of all liquids in its body. Oh, that's some fighting spirit, Sokka mocked the creature. But with his acting skill, he could read others' intentions quite well. And he was somewhat able to tell that the tree had alternative intentions. Anyway, I can guess that if you don't care about the forest, then you must be here for me then. That had been his first guess too. But he didn't want to reveal too much. After all, he wasn't supposed to know what would originally happen. You are somewhat right. But I was ordered by someone to capture you. If you let me live I will dash wish. Sokka's spear flew through the air and cut the brittle tree into a thousand pieces. No thanks. I don't like letting my enemies walk out alive and then grow to become stronger enemies. That would be a cliche mistaken kind of dumb. You have killed. Heart eating willow tree. Level 159 you have leveled up you. Have leveled up you have leveled up. A lot of level up notifications popped up. And Sokka was at level 38. Ash power leveling for the win. Killing high level monsters is way faster than doing so with low leveled people. Though he didn't say it out loud. Sokka had noticed something else too. The spirits seemed to have very high levels, probably because they were very long living beings. They were thousands of years old, and their power and existence accumulated for a long time. Now Sokka couldn't wait until he got access to the spirit world. Just imagining how many high leveled beings he would be able to kill, made a chill go down his spine. How old were spirits like Rava and Vatu? Their levels had to be incomprehensible. Like always, Sokka made sure to put all of his stats points into luck. 
which brought luck to 186, even though he passed the 150 thresh mark. There was no new skill like it had been like when luck reached 50 and 100. But that only meant that after the 100 thresholds had been passed, now a new skill related to luck came only after each 100 passed. Meaning the next time he might gain something will be once his luck reaches 200. Sokka looked around and frowned in disappointment. There was nothing dropped by the tree. No special item. No nothing. Well, you win some, you lose some. My power affects me but not the world. Ever since coming to this world, Sokka had been experimenting with his gamer interface and seeing its limits. There seemed to be one absolute rule to the ability, and that was it couldn't affect the outside world at all. The only way it could do so was in the roundabout manner of changing Sokka, who then could cause change to the environment. As he walked off, Sokka's mind was preoccupied, trying to think of ways to cheat the system. Though he couldn't think of something to exploit, one day he planned to have at least one experience points farm. Since he knew that if he was somehow able to find an exploit, the system wouldn't fix itself because it wasn't an AI. Sokka casually walked towards the village as night came about. He wasn't in a rush and instead tried to think of strategies on how to kill off spirits. As he walked back to the village, Sokka was just in time. A couple of houses had been destroyed by Hai Bai, but that was all within his expectations. Young man, Kei Fon, the elder who had met him before, came and looked at Sokka worryingly. The avatar has chased after the beasts. Well, I am sure he can handle it, Sokka shrugged, not worried about the avatar. It was his job to take care of spirits. Anyway, where is my sister? Your sister well she was kidnapped by the spirit while trying to help the avatar. The old man nervously explained what had happened. But as he glanced at Sokka's face, the old man fell on his back, and a terrified look appeared on his face. Fear gripped his heart as he caught sight of the young man's expression. Fwish. Sokka's body disappeared in front of his eyes. Ash Sokka POV I moved quickly past the trees as I used the map to help me track the spirit that had kidnapped Katara. What worried me wasn't high by, since he wouldn't hurt people and even helped Ang on several occasions. But if the tree spirit's words, who I just killed, are to be trusted, then I had caught the attention of another strong spirit. One strong enough to order around something like the tree spirit. Now my sister being in the spirit world, that would be the perfect opportunity for whoever had their attention on me to try and lure me out by using Katara. At least that was what I would do if I wanted to lure someone out. Traveling through the trees from branch to branch, the forest seemed to melt for a split second. You have entered the spirit world, yeah. I had noticed that even without the help of the notification. Looking around, everything seemed normal, as if I was still in that same forest. Even the branch I stood on seemed the same. Immediately, I tried to use bending, but as expected, it didn't work. You can't use bending in the spirit world, yeah. Technically, unless one entered with their body, they wouldn't be able to use bending. Or maybe it was just certain parts of the spirit world one couldn't bend. I didn't know the specifics of this, but it didn't matter as I still had the spear sky piercer in my hand. Brave warrior? Suddenly a feminine voice rang through the forest, looking around. I saw nothing. Suddenly it felt like someone breathed in my ear. I like strong people, without bending. They are just my type of man. Immediately, I swung backward, my spear cutting through the air at incredible speeds. But it was for naught as nobody was there. Taking a deep breath, I calmed myself and closed my eyes. If you want to talk, then how about at least showing yourself? I am afraid that if I did so, that spear of yours would quickly find its way into my heart. Brave warrior. She seemed almost ecstatic to be talking to me. But right now, I didn't mind her continuing to talk. Because she just unintentionally gave away why she was observing me. It was because I was a so-called strong warrior without bending. That must be what attracted her attention. The chances of this being the spirit who ordered the spirit tree were high. That was good. Now, I could take care of this problem before it became too troublesome. Though I had come to the spirit world, where my opponent had the advantage and I couldn't use bending. I had predicted a situation like this and had just the countermeasure against it. First, let's try and find my enemy's identity. Information gotcha roll initiated random gotcha roll initiated. It was a little sad that I had to use two gotcha rolls, as those were limited. But that wasn't something I minded too much. After all, I had just leveled up eight times just recently, and I still had eight new rolls. If this spirit is killed, then these rolls should be easy to replace. I will show you bitch. You don't fuck with a lucky guy like me. Even if I had to use all of my gotcha rolls today, this new enemy had to die. Sokka didn't like mystery and surprises in his life. So, the first gotcha that he had activated finally yielded results. Information gotcha results the spirit known as the evil lady has taken notice of you. That was a roundabout way of saying that the thing here with me was the evil lady. Fuck. That name didn't give me a lot of hope of beating her. The spirit called the evil lady is also known as the spirit of strife. Strife. So that meant that she was a spirit that liked to cause conflict. Maybe she wanted to cause trouble and difficulty for me. If her other name wasn't the evil lady, then he might assume her intentions might have been to help him through creating challenges. But now, with that name alone, evil lady, 
He knew it meant that her intentions for him weren't good. The evil lady has tricked many spirits to serve her. The evil lady has the hobby of making deals. The information about her kept pouring, and it wasn't good at all. So pretty much, no matter what, Sokka understood one thing very clearly. Ash don't fucking make a deal with her. Then came the rest of the information, which made Sokka look at it strangely. A cat in Bar Sing Si is pregnant, pinged on Map Lee. Chen's wife is having an affair with the neighbor, pinged on Map Adai Lee. In Ba Sing Si is having a homosexual relationship with one of his colleagues, pinged on Map Hai. What the hell? The latter part of the information bracket was completely useless. Was this how the ability would have worked normally if I didn't have high luck? Ash contemplated Sokka. Glad that he had high luck offset the gotcha, or else it would have been a terrible ability. In actuality, it could have even brought things that could be harmful to him. At least now Sokka knew the identity of the woman who had an unnatural interest in me. Though that was what the information said, he hoped Gotcha wasn't talking about some other random spirit. This was the problem with luck, it was very unstable, and one couldn't tell if it worked or not. Random roll finished you have gained. Boots of teleportation, boots of teleportation, rare and normal looking pair of boots. That give the user the ability to teleport into a place they have been to before. To use you just have to think of the place and class the boots. Then you will be teleported away. Usage has left 10 tenths. Sokka clenched his fist and ground his teeth as he saw the new notification. This was the kind of situation he didn't like and knew that escaping here was the best choice. No matter how lucky one was, if they act foolishly then they will be killed. Even luck could only improve things up only until a certain level. But understanding the futility of being angry, he chuckled and shook his head. He stared at the space in front of him. I don't know who or what you are. He lied through his teeth trying to have his enemy drop their guard. But I will kill you one day. Oh that's scary. What did I even do to earn that kind of hate? A strong spirit appears, attacks me, my sister disappears. And then you come around, Sokka said with an angry look in his eyes. He was confident that the woman was unlikely to be involved with Katara's kidnapping. Still, he said these things to misguide her and keep his abilities secret. Come on now, don't blame me for everything. Though he couldn't see the woman, Sokka felt like she was pouting in annoyance. There was a strange hypnotic tune to her voice. Also, I wasn't involved with your sister's kidnapping. It was another spirit. Also, I genuinely am interested in you and would like to make a deal that would benefit us both. Due to his information gotcha. Sokka knew that making deals with this woman was troublesome, and might lead him to a path of slavery. So he took out a small vial from his pocket, he poured it from his inventory. But this action was to disguise his inventory. He threw the vial in the air, and pulled out two flint stones from his pocket too, and threw them. The first stone broke the glass vial, and the second flint stone connected with the first creating a spark. The vial was filled with alcohol, who on a small fire blew out and into the trees, starting a small fire. By now Sokka was gone from his place and had teleported away. What was that? Asked the feminine voice, not having noticed just how Sokka had disappeared. The burning alcohol landed on the trees, and they started catching fire. ECH, I like men who are strong, but not those that are also smart enough to see through me. Sadly, he seems to fall in the second category. Sokka was back in the forest close to the village he had last visited, his eyes closed in concentration, he took a deep breath and opened them. Surprisingly easy to use, he murmured while looking at the new boots. They looked like shoes made out of alligator skin. The ones that would suit him very well if he was a pimp of course. They look ugly as hell though. When he walked back into the village he saw everyone was safe and had returned. Even Katara had come. And once she saw Sokka, she rushed with tears in her eyes and hugged him. Where were you? I was worried sick. Looking for you, obviously. And then I got lost Sokka said, as if it was her fault that he got lost. Immediately Arm could sense that a wave of bickering would occur between the two siblings. If he didn't do something about it. Ah, I think we should go Sokka. I will explain what happened later. But we need to set off right now. Avatar Roku said that he had something important to tell me. Sadly, neither of the siblings paid attention to the Avatar as they continued their bickering. So it is my fault that you got lost well. You said it. And you implied it. I have no recollection of doing that. You just did it. Did I? The siblings bickering went on for quite a while and lasted even after they got on Appa and set off into the air. Arm um, this time had been the one to receive the villagers' thanks and procure the supplies, even though Sokka usually did that. But the verbal argument stopped when Sokka caught sight of a little fox hiding behind Katara, and a malicious look appeared on his face. Sokka ran his hand through the animal's fur as it shook, and he nodded. I told you to take care of Katara, it seems like you failed. The little fox quickly nodded its head as if to apologize. But that didn't seem to phase its owner as he continued. You have quite the nice fur. I wonder how much it will sell on the market. Market. The little fox paled at the sight of Sokka, as he implied that he would skin the small creature and sell its fur. Hey, don't bully Kiwi. Katara intervened and hugged the little fox close to her chest. She tried to save me, even though she clearly couldn't do anything. Who the hell is Kiwi? Sokka inquired curiously, 
The fox, obviously, she answered, snidely, sending a smug smirk at her brother, which in turn annoyed her internally, because he didn't seem to have even seen the look she sent him. His name isn't Kiwi. As its owner I have named it emergency food number two, Soccer insisted. Though the little fox wasn't what she seemed, he knew that for now, the creature seemed quite useless. What? Katara was again mad at her brother, unable to hold in her annoyance she ended up yelling. It sounded like Sokka had a natural talent for getting under her skin. Number two. Then who was number one? Arm was curious about other, smaller things. Because he knew that deep down Sokka would never hurt Kiwi probably maybe hopefully. The more unthought about it, the more it seemed like Sokka might one day decide to get a fox leather hat. He seemed like the kind of guy who would do something like that. Momo, of course, he responded without missing a beat. You can't eat Momo. Arn refuted him, and Momo made some angry lemur noises trying to scare Sokka off. Also Kiwi as a girl, Katara added on as an afterthought. By now she had calmed down by meditating on her feelings. She had gotten good at this, as her brother's behavior was often very irritating, and she had to learn to control her emotions the hard way. Wait, really? Sokka inquired with an uninterested look that showed that he didn't care either way. Maybe if she was more useful then I wouldn't call her emergency food number two. In the end he kept emphasizing Kiwi's gender, just to annoy his sister a little. His demeanor was super effective, and not long later, they were back to quarreling with each other. As it went past midnight, Sokka was the one holding Appa's rings as Katara. Ahn, Kiwi, and Momo fell to sleep. The Sky Bison had rested and slept in the village before they had set off, so it should be able to travel through the night and by morning reached the fire temple. At least that's what Aang had said, and Sokka wasn't a flying bison specialist, but he trusted his friend's words. Having nothing better to do when by now the relationship between Zabuza and him had developed into a good friendship, Sokka was planning to invite a new member to the multiversal group chat. Inviting new chat group member Demonic Dragon has joined the group chat dash Sokka POV Demonic Dragon. The name didn't ring any bells. During the first time, I had a suspicion that Miss Demon had been Zabuza, but Demonic Dragon was too wide of a spectrum. I could think of a dozen characters who would fit that description at the top of my head. Demonic Dragon, unknown B-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Welcome young traveler, Demonic Dragon. What? Who are you? B-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. The road will make itself clear in the darkest of time. Demonic Dragon, WTF. After that, I stopped responding, and thankfully Zabuza wasn't online either, so he didn't see what I was writing. This was all so there would be a sense of mystery around me, and soon enough the guy or gal will start unconsciously revealing more information about themselves, while they try and ask for info. Sometimes you could tell a lot about a person by the questions they asked. So I wanted to get them as curious as possible. Also just because he used WTF as a shortening of the words what the fuck, there was a high chance that the person was someone young. Older people don't normally use WTF. Soon enough, these small things should add up, and I should be able to guess their identity by then. For hours, the new group member kept asking questions. At first, he was calm, but then got aggressive and left. Demonic Dragon, fuck you. Demonic Dragon, what the fuck? Answer you bastard. E-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Sometimes you need to be the same kind of animal, but a different beast. Scrolling through the swear words and rants of anger, I could see a pattern. Anger, anger, anger. And in the end, there was no calmness. He didn't even apologize. After all, I hadn't even insulted him, just said some strange and mysterious words. The guy seemed quite young, and I had determined his gender too, as he said that he would fuck my mother. Girls don't usually swear like that. Also judging by his tone, he probably was around his 20s, and had been feeling stuck in life lately. Anger wasn't an emotion you should use when trying to argue with someone in what was essentially an online chat. People have a lot more time than you think, and sounding angry wasn't the right response to anything. Instead, it will just make you seem foolish. Yeah. I had a rough guess of who he was, but I didn't have any conclusive evidence yet. Miss Demon, who's the angry kid? Since the new member had gone offline, it seemed like Zabuza had woken up and read the previous messages. E-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64, new member. I was just teaching our junior about life. Miss Demon, aren't you around the same age? This fucker, I never told him my age, but he seemed to have figured it out. Then again, I wasn't the only one who was good at getting information out of people. Someone like Zabuza was probably leagues ahead, not was he older and more experienced, but he was trained since childhood to do this. On the other hand, I just picked up the skill during my last life. Still, Zabuza was checkmated a long time ago, he just didn't know it yet. Not only did I already know his identity, but from the Naruto series, I even knew him better than he knew himself. Honestly, this wasn't even a checkmate. More like me cheating in the game and then going to the game developer's house, and fucking his wife too. It might sound like an exaggeration, but that was the comparison in how many steps ahead of Zabuza I was. Still, 
I didn't mind having him think he was still ahead of me. After all, telling him the truth wouldn't be beneficial. But having Zabuza think of me as someone he could outplay, then I was alright with that. Miss Demon. By the way, I have been thinking of this for a while. But we might be from different worlds. I knew that already. But I decided to act a little surprised. E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. What? That was when I noticed that we were being tailed. Though it was dark and I couldn't see who attacked us. I noticed a giant boulder missile encased in fire coming towards us. Looking at the map, I noticed that it was Zuko and his ship. But there was something even more dangerous ahead of us. They were shooting at us. Um, Katara, if you don't wake up we are gonna die the way I told them was gentle. And Arn opened his eyes and yawned. Is it morning already? No, a giant rock covered in fire is being thrown at us. I calmly replied. Ha! Huh. He was still a little sleepy. But as soon as he looked towards the light, he saw what it was. Oh no, we are going to get it. Yeah, that's kinder obvious. I am not a good enough Sky Bison rider to maneuver him to dodge that. And it's kinder too late to have you take the rings and dodge. How are you still calm at this? The question should be, why are you so panicked at this? Panicking won't solve anything. Also, I don't think I can cut giant rocks like that. So kinder pointless to worry about it. Arm was panicking. But if I used my MP on my spear. But I was going to have the avatar deal with this, as showing all of my cards right now wasn't a smart decision. Especially since the evil lady might be observing me. Using his airbending, Arn went against the fire missile. And changed its direction with a wind blast. Just enough so it could miss Appa. But soon enough, more flaming catapult shots were thrown. And Arn had to try his best, as he grabbed the rings. And maneuvered Appa to dodge. I just picked up my spear from the ground. Since I didn't want to reveal my infantry powers. I had kept the sky piercer spear outside. Arn, just concentrate on maneuvering out of the shots. Also, be careful of the other ships in front of us. By using the map, I had seen Zhao and a hundred or so Fire Nation. That made Zuko's ship seem minuscule, and had made a barricade in front of us. Which was dangerous. So now I have to help him try to get us past that. Fuom, even though it was dark, the sky turned red as Zhao's ship started firing. I was a little shocked because it seemed like they had already noticed us. Taking a deep breath, Katra woke up and was surprised. What's that? This is just your brother about to do the coolest shit he has ever done. Kiwi. The little fox cutlery woke up and rubbed its face, looking at my eyes, and knew that the situation was grave. Time to become useful. The little fox nodded as if understanding me. Katara seemed worried, and even I was a little nervous. But at the same time, I had been planning for this situation for quite a while now. Kiwi jumped out of Appa's saddle, and Katara was worried about the little fox, and called out to her worryingly. Kiwi. Sokka too jumped out of Appa. And Katara went to the edge looking down worryingly. There she saw Sokka plummeting towards the water. But he turned around and gave his sister a peace sign while mouthing. Don't worry and just enjoy the show. That was when a light shone so bright that it dwarfed even the fires in the sky. And a mighty creature that shot Katara and even Un. Majestic white silver fur, red eyes, about the size of Appa. And a blue fire was around it. Nine tails swished around as it levitated. What's that? A wolf. Wondered Katara, mythicized by the majestic creature. A nine-tailed fox spirit, exclaimed Un. That is one of the strongest and most dangerous spirits. Fwosh. The nine-tailed fox flew through the air and caught Sokka before he could fall in the water. With him on its back, it shone even brighter. Being atop the nine-tailed fox, Sokka was ecstatic. Though the feeling of this would have been more wonderful for someone who wasn't already used to Appa. Through using Observe, he knew that Kiwi was a very strong spirit. But at the same time, he had been unlucky in this draw. Because while Kiwi was a strong familiar, with almost offerably potential, she was still a level 1 and very young. For nine tail foxes to evolve, they needed around a thousand years. Right now, what Kiwi transformed into her real form. Nine tailed foxes could transform, and usually, in their younger years, they disguised themselves as normal foxes to hide from other predators. Also this forceful transformation wasn't a thing that could be used too often. But desperate situations called for desperate countermeasures. Kiwi, use foxfire. Sokka muttered to her ear as the majestic fox seemed to fly, no more like jumping and walking on air. Taking a deep breath, Kiwi blew a pillar of blue fire into the sky. The flames were so hot that it made Sokka wince just by being on Kiwi's back. He calculated the trajectory and told Kiwi where she must blow the flames to create a hole on the burning catapult shots in the sky. That way Appa would be able to pass through there. But there was another problem. Even if they created a path, another volley of shots would come from the hundreds of ships under Xiao's control. If he didn't take care of the problem from the root of it, then it would create trouble for him later. Sokka also had another goal. And that was to kill Zhao. That was one of the major things he wished to change. Zhao was the kind of man with the knowledge and stupidity to do very reckless things. While not thinking of the consequences. Stupid people were sometimes stupidly dangerous. Flying through the air, Sokka used the map to pinpoint where amongst the many large battleships Zhao was in. Once he found it, he jumped off Kiwi. Letting her go and help Appa and the rest as he landed on the ship. Buom immediately, a volley of fire went towards him. 
But with Skypiercer, Sokka's agility was very high. Foam covered him from all around, and a blue fire seemed to start in his position. To everyone's surprise, the fire seemed to unnaturally flow upward as he spun his spear and ducked down. There seemed to be no damage on his body, as even his clothes were fine. Before being caught by Kiwi, Sokka was plummeting towards the water. He had waterbended some water into his clothes, and created a thin mucus-like armor of water around himself. Still, though, there were around 50 firebenders that had surrounded him. Even for Sokka, this was a situation he wouldn't be able to easily get out of. Though he seemed unhurt by the blast before, he had taken 300 health points of damage. And that wasn't a small thing. Clenching his teeth, Sokka's concentration soared. Immediately he used the map to see where every single enemy and even Zhao was. Looking up at one of the balconies on the high part of the ship, there was Zhao with a smirk on his face and two guards around him. Little bird, you just fell on the wrong nest. Sokka chuckled. Dumbass, don't try to act smart all of a sudden. Sokka kicked off the ground and charged towards one of the soldiers. The fire almost licked his face as the firebender panicky shot out flames. Go away, he yelled out, horrified. This is the one who seems like the leader of this squad. Taking him out will help breaking their spirits. But his death must be caused by someone else and not me. Dash he contemplated and within a split second thought up a plan. Sokka used the palm of his hand and easily pushed the man up and used him as a shield as fire was thrown toward him. Ah, the man yelled out as Sokka casually threw him to the side. By now the firebenders were panicked, none of them dared to shoot out fire, as for a split second, they were scared of burning alive one of their allies. Sometimes, a battle was more of mental warfare, and using one's allies as a shield would be more terrifying than even attacking them. Sokka knew that winning against essentially thousands was impossible. He knew that even if he was able to defeat the ones here, other firebenders from other ships would come. So instead he had to destroy the chain of command here. Using people's heads as a walking space he ran amongst the small army on the ship and jumped up, catching himself on a railing, and that was when Zhao started seeming worried. Shoot him down. Boom. Blasts of fire came towards Sokka. But they were useless as by using sense danger. He was able to dodge most of them, and the others he could cut up with his spear. He saw Xiao going inside and smirked. This was what he had wanted to do all this time. The leader has shown fear, whispered Sokka, his eyes shining like a peak predator. So how can the subordinates now be confident of victory even against one guy? Since their commander had gone into hiding, many soldiers were afraid. Still, some lift their spirits up and attack Sokka. Everyone, he is just a young man. We outnumber him. Yeah, there is nothing to be afraid of. You are right. Captain Zhao has always been like this. The soldiers quickly convinced themselves to not be afraid as some amongst them kept a calm head. Sokka saw this and knew that right now, he had to be ferocious and put the devil's fear in their hearts. Jumping down, he smiled as widely as he could to make himself seem like some kind of battle maniac. Come on, fight me. Let's dance together with the Grim Reaper. He cringed a little internally, as those words sounded something an anime character would say. But to his surprise, the soldiers became terrified, even the ones who had been calm were already shaking. No one liked fighting against madmen that had nothing to lose. Sokka didn't let them think too much about it, and charged ahead fearlessly, fire was thrown about clumsily. But now that he wasn't under the barrage of coordinated fire bending, he found it much easier to move around, and even went and knocked out some people. Since Ang was going to have to come pick him up, Sokka didn't want to leave a trail of bodies where his friend could see them. What is this? Asked Sokka, frowning while looking at the balcony where Zhao used to be. You guys fight and risk your life for guys like that. Hey, don't you have families in the Fire Nation? Those words made them hesitate as they looked at their burned up comrade. Sokka had to hold himself back from jumping up in victory, because now he could see that his words had gotten them. In his last words, wars were usually fought with people who spoke a different language. So that was how not many soldiers could be influenced. But during the times of civil war, where both sides spoke the same language, there was a lot more leeway to use people's emotions to stop them. To Sokka a certain memory of history came to his mind. In his past life, while reading about the American Civil War, during charges, some soldiers would stop shooting because they couldn't bear killing their countrymen and hearing their cries. Now it is time to get these guys to start doubting the command system a little. Zhao is my target today, and I need to get rid of him before the Northern Water Tribe invasion. Ash Sokka already had a speech in mind, something that was used by a famous person in his last life. Acting skill activated. We all as humans need to put an end to war, or war will put an end to us, Sokka said passionately. This was a speech that he had prepared beforehand. With acting skill, he could pull such a performance perfectly. Like an actor trying to draw in its audience, any mistakes that could have been related to bad luck or minor misfortune were eliminated. The only thing left was the true and simplistic emotions that appeared on his face. We are brothers and sisters. Why do we butcher each other for a wrong ideal? Or for some commander he was too cowardly to fight for you. He looked each person in the eyes with a hawk-like glint. It made everyone nervous and put them on the spot. Some people amongst them didn't care for his speech, but they didn't dare act and decided to go with the crowd. As they might get killed by Sokka, 
and it seemed like their comrades were too distracted to do anything. This fucking kid, he has everyone swept by his words. Ash thought one of the soldiers who wasn't convinced by the speech, but looking around, he could see by the posture of his colleagues that they didn't want to fight soccer and were willing to hear him out. This is unlucky as hell, the soldier whispered to himself. These guys are almost all those who feel guilty for their deeds. The soldier knew about his colleagues and how they sometimes had sleepless nights from what they had to do. Fuck, there is nothing I can do. I just need to wait for an opportunity to break the brat's argument apart. He convinces these guys to desert, then a tidal wave will follow. There were a lot of unsatisfied Fire Nation soldiers that will start deserting, and we can't punish them all. Sokka didn't know any of this, and didn't even think of having the soldiers desert. He just needed to have the main ship stop shooting at Appa, and that would work well for him, since the other ships would also stop shooting. After all, there was no radio communication in this world, and only signals. So most commanders would order the other ships to attack, as long as the main ship attacked. Of course, Sokka didn't know such detailed information about the Fire Nation, but he could guess that it was something similar to signals. But he knew just how bad having the ladder running away would seem. Though he was from a technologically advanced world, Sokka wasn't anything special. If an average physicist went back a hundred years in time, then he would be the best physicist in the world. Knowledge evolved rapidly, just ten years would show major differences. Sokka wasn't a physicist either, but he had the average knowledge an internet user would have. Meaning he knew a lot of cringe and I'm speeches that would be super effective when someone heard them for the first time. You had to travel to a whole new world to find them not cringe, but it worked. Also, he knew some good military strategies that were fun to watch on YouTube channels. That explained it easily, like oversimplified and such. Do not judge people by their background, Sokka said, his eyes looking at the people around him, his gaze changed from intense to a gentle one. Fire Nation killed my mother, he told them bluntly, shocking the people. This made people's hearts clench, which deployed soldier hadn't killed someone. They were very rare, but being under Zhao, they had done some atrocious things. So everyone here had killed at least one person. Someone like Zhao wasn't a good commander and he only got promoted because he wagged his tail like a dog and knew how to follow orders. Soldiers needed consultation by their leader every time they had killed to let them think that it was for the greater good even when it wasn't. But for someone like Xiao, why would he bother with even having a conversation with his soldiers? I wondered why they did that so many times, but never came up with anything. You are people here who are also part of the Fire Nation. Do you kill women too in front of their children? Should I hate you? An unknown person I have never met before. Sokka paused for a little, seeing everyone look down in shame. He waited for someone to speak. This is my chance. Ash thought the soldier who wasn't convinced by Sokka's speech. He looked at everyone around him like they were stupid. After all, if he did a good job here then he would get a promotion from Zhao. And that was all he cared about. The water tribes in the Earth Kingdom are Dash. A what? Sokka frowned, interrupting the man. This was the chance he had been waiting for. Protecting their lands. Nobody welcomed the Fire Nation's invasion. Do you still have delusions about spreading greatness? Is killing my mother and other people's parents the Fire Nation's way to spread greatness? Bitch, don't talk to me like you are some kinder smartest. I will hammer you down like a nail sticking out. Now that one person who spoke up has been hammered down, others will become more reluctant to speak. The one who wins an argument is the one who speaks the most. You can't win an argument if I do not let you say anything. Ash Sokka had thought of a speech like this a hundred times over. Sure, he might not have planned it for this exact situation, but his mother had been killed by a Fire Nation soldier, and he planned to use that to earn more sympathy. Though this speech was supposed to be used for his future political campaign, if he became the leader of the Southern Water Tribe, he will have to make another one by then, and he had more than enough to do so by then. Though Sokka had miscalculated one thing and that was just how much guilt these soldiers would feel from his words. Knowing that they had killed someone's parents, brother, someone's husband, the guilt almost crushed them. They had seen just how people looked at them. Children Children crying and looking at them with hate for killing their parents, starving villages that were annexed by the Fire Nation. The crimes of a whole cruel regime weighed down on them. What they wanted wasn't glory. They weren't young children anymore, and knew that they could die any day now. That was the life of a soldier. But what they want most right now is forgiveness. They wanted to be forgiven for their sins, as they knew what they had done. But something happened that even Sokka hadn't expected. The Fire Nation soldiers fell to their knees and took off their helmets, showing their faces. They had wincing looks filled with shame, and he was even more confused. What do I do now? Ash Sokka wasn't prepared for something like this. In his mind, he had planned for his enemies to hesitate a bit when they heard this well-prepared political speech that he didn't believe in himself. 
He never believed that there was such a thing as succeeding too much. Well, he started believing now, because he had no idea what to do with these people. So they suddenly called him respectfully, freaking Sokka out and making his skin crawl. He could feel something bad was about to come. Please forgive us. We have committed many sins in this life, and don't want to die with them. One of the Fire Nation soldiers begged and others followed along. He thought of the screams of the villages they had slaughtered, and he shook his head trying to get rid of such a thought. But it wouldn't go away. Sokka just stood there and didn't say anything. He had planned for when his speech might go wrong, or if the soldiers decided to attack him again. But he hadn't planned at all about his speech going too well. Ash, I'm so fucked. What do I do now? What Sokka didn't know was that his words stroked a part of their feelings that he never thought about. Compassion, they were putting themselves in his shoes and wondered. How could such a man be so forgiving? In their eyes, anyone whose mother got killed by the enemy would make them hateful. Yet the young man in front of them didn't hate them. It made the soldiers feel shame they hadn't felt in their whole lives. They were reminded of their own families. Sokka had a calm exterior. They knew he had the strength to fight and possibly even kill them all. Yet the man stood there calm as if he had predicted what had happened. He was like a saintly figure untainted by the sins of mortal men. Sokka stood tall and looked at them all with a calm gaze. Ash Sokka POV holy shit. Holy fuck, I planned in case I fail, but not when I succeed like this. What do I even say here? Now that I had all of this momentum, failing now would suck. Well, when you don't know what to say, saying nothing is better than saying anything. So I just stayed quiet and looked at them with a serious, but sincere look. These things were so out of my league. How will they react to this gaze I was making? I had about zero experience with these things. Still, though, I was at least prepared if the people here decided to attack me again. So, with that in mind, I can't back down. Thankfully I hadn't shown anything outwardly due to Gamer's mind. Should you be apologizing to me? I calmly stated. You have done nothing against me. You do not carry the crimes of your fellow Fire Nation soldiers. So you shouldn't carry their guilt either. That was when I noticed something even stranger. The people had tears in their eyes as they bowed in forgiveness and regret. Fuck oi, 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 the luck stat was supposed to put me in a favorable situation. Why the fuck isn't it working? Because the situation just went way out of my league. Why are you guys bowing? I asked them trying to be calm outwardly. The thing I needed the most was information. What were they thinking? This was irrational behavior in my opinion. We, we were just blinding ourselves, said one of them, pulling their head up. I saw that it was a man with a goatee and dark hair. He seemed sad at something. I thought that as I followed orders, no. That was just my excuse so I wouldn't feel guilty. So he was just a guy stuck on a battlefield that he didn't want to be in. Most of the military was like this. It was either people who had no idea what they were getting into, or those that had no other choice. Though some knew that being in the military would offer a free scholarship. I doubt the Fire Nation offered even the latter. These firebenders seem quite aged, so they probably knew to think for themselves. No, it would be more correct to say that they just needed to hear someone say it. This was lucky of me to meet all of these people luck was unpredictable. Something that I had barely any control over. The only way I could control it was by controlling my actions and trying to incite a lucky event to happen. But luck could be dangerous. Because a lot of people who were considered lucky sometimes lived a very tragic life. So I have to be careful with it. Especially to stop me from relying too much on luck. Heroes were lucky Greek heroes especially had great luck. That's what everyone will say. Heracles was born as the son of a god. Yet, his life was so tragic. I don't want to have a life like that. Still though, for the soldiers to be so willing to ask for forgiveness. This means that I have been very lucky. Understanding that was fundamental. And while this could be considered good luck, things could develop worse if the lucky opportunity wasn't grasped. Do you know what happens to a hero who fails? That heroic tale can easily turn into a tragedy with one mistake. I took a deep breath and channeled Kai into the tip of my spear. Something I had been able to do since getting Spear Mastery past level 20 and sunk the tip of my spear in the metallic deck clang. That drew everyone's attention back to me. Now wasn't the time to mull over whether I was good at public speeches or not. Instead, I had to come up with something on the fly. I am not someone who can forgive anything. But if you follow me, the best I can do is to lead you into a path of redemption. Though I said that, I had no idea how to go about it. That was why wording it in such a way was important. They will be expecting something in the future, but for now, I'm safe. They nodded, and the man with a goatee, that seemed like their temporary leader, looked at me intently. Then, what should we do now? The fuck? You are an adult, don't ask stuff like that to a teenager like me. Seems like I will have to say something vague and dodge the question completely. Saying a concrete answer and then failing might turn them into hateful enemies because I deceived them. What should you do? Shouldn't you decide that yourself? Forgiveness isn't something I can give. 
but something you must earn. Take that sage-like advice and fuck off. Those were the thoughts in my mind as I smiled at them gently. Can't these guys think for themselves? Your commander was a bad man, so how about you take care of him? He was the one who has given orders that have resulted in thousands of deaths. Though the words I used were soft, these guys would have to take care of Zhao. Not only would that end up with him dead, which was one of my own goals, but the ones who would kill him won't be able to ever return to the Fire Nation. That was two birds with one stone. Because after these guys did that, then they will have to fight against the Fire Nation. After saying that, I just walked off as I saw Appa diving through the air and landing next to me. Looking back at the soldiers, I waved at them. You know what to do already and have no need for my help. So just do what feels right in your heart. Yes. They yelled out enthusiastically, a flame of bloodlust was lit in their eyes. This was what was scary about people. They would kill someone just to prove that they were in the right. Tribal mentality was there too, as even the ones who weren't convicted by me would have to follow. We flew off, and I just looked at them rushing into the ship to look for Zhao. They will probably fail and die as the other Fire Nation soldiers from the rest of the ships come and kill them all. There was no other choice. I couldn't stay back with them or would have gotten killed too. But, who knows, they might be successful and able to escape all of this. Even though I think that had a very low chance of happening, I feel kinda sorry for them. They were used by Zhao, and now me. But sadly, I wasn't going to risk my life for them. Also today I learned something incredible. Luck could be dangerous. Right now, when the people were listening to my speech, it should have been effective. It was too effective, and the people gathered there were the ones who fell for it too easily. Having people like that in one place wasn't easy, and very rare. So luck played a huge part in it. Well, things worked out well in the end. For me at least. I didn't see anything as you said, and I quote, Badis. All you did was just talk. Katara found this moment to send a snide comment at me. Deciding to not fall to her word traps, I kept quiet. I think that is even more impressive, said Aung suddenly. He was able to do all that just by using his words. Using violence is easy but convincing people to not fight is even harder. Oh, right, a pacifist like him would be more impressed with me talking my way out of a situation than fighting a hundred people off. Katara, you should be impressed by my charisma, I said smugly. But in reality, both Aung and Katara knew that between the three of us, usually only I did the talking when it came to situations that required it. If you didn't brag so much about yourself, then maybe I might see you as someone cool. I smiled at her, but that would be a problem, little sister. After all, as siblings, if I am not expressing things like these to you, then we will slowly start drifting apart. When the time comes that you have to try and actively make yourself seem without faults, and not speak your mind in front of me easily, then that will be when our relationship will be over. Sometimes relationships can be complicated, and not understanding them can be quite disastrous. I and Katara were brother and sister, there was no need for me to act like some kind of Casanova with her, since we aren't dating, nor am I trying to woo her. It doesn't matter if your family sees your bad side. After all, if you can't be your true self with your family and trust them, then who can you even trust in this world? By dawn, we arrived on a crescent-shaped island, and on top of it was the tower. The temple, the one where Avadaroku's status lay. One of the stupidest avatars of his time, though they were all kind of very unsuited to be avatars, maybe Kashi being the only one who understood her responsibilities. Arn's weakness and inability to kill someone, would create a lot of problems even for the avatar after him. Men with consciousness were good people, but horrible leaders, someone that no one should allow to make decisions. Because he will base everything on emotion, and that was worse than even corruption. Appa went and got a well-deserved rest on the outskirts of the island, while I, Katara, Aun, and Momo went towards the temple. The five fire sages were there, waiting for us. It seemed like they had already gotten news of what was happening. Welcome, Avatar, one of them that seemed the oldest bowed towards us, and he rose, a small smirk on his face. How may we help you? You know about me. Aung inquired, surprised that they already knew about him and how he looked. Of course, the oldest fire sage smiled gently. Well, these guys know that they can't defeat Aung head on and decided to do this. That's very interesting. Let's see how they act. The fire sages continued talking with Aung, as I discreetly went and checked the dimensional chat, and saw that Zabuza and Demonic Dragon had a chat, while I had been fighting on Zhao's ship. And there were a couple of messages that caught my eyes. One of them was about Zabuza describing how to use the transformation Jutsu, and Demonic Dragon wasn't able to use it. Even someone from his world who could use Chakra had tried, but couldn't use the transformation Jutsu either. Seeing this, an idea came to mind. Also, Demonic Dragon's identity has become clear now. With almost 100% certainty I can assume that Demonic Dragon was Vali Lucifer from DXD, and the person who he said had Chakra in his world was probably Kuroka. The way the Fire Sages were going was very different from the original timeline, so they were probably ordered to do something. Obviously not something in our best interest, but what were they planning to do? While following Arn as he talked with the Sages, 
I kept an eye on all of them. Honorable Soccer, Lady Katara, the Fire Sages addressed us too. We are honored to have the Avatars crew here with us. Katara was about to say something, but I walked in front of her in a manner that might seem rude and greeted the men. Hi there, so you are sages, right? So like, you know everything. Ha ha ha, the eldest amongst them laughed amusingly. It seemed like he found my questions funny. No, far from that. We are but normal people who serve the Avatar. Sokka, don't ask such stupid questions. Katara elbowed me lightly to my side, and I looked her in the eyes. Immediately, she looked back, and although she had a smile on her face, she side glanced towards the Fire Sages multiple times. She was signaling me that there was something suspicious about them. Seems like my cute little sister is smarter than most would think. Sorry. Sorry, I apologize with a foolish smile on my face, and put an arm around Katara's neck. Also, little sis, don't treat me so badly, normally she would waterbend my face off if I did something like this. But while the others might only see us acting as siblings, Katara noticed my finger that was pointing downward. Looking towards the ground, she saw many footsteps left on the soft earth. It was much more than five people could leave, more as if an army had passed through here. Katara was suspicious before, but now she was on guard. I felt her body tense once she saw that and was now ready to waterbend and fight her way out of here. But I nudged her slightly and whispered to her, Don't act suspicious, we might be surrounded already. Let's play along for a while. The fire sages were running circles around Arn and asking him many questions, so they didn't pay attention to us. Which was good, as that meant they weren't too worried about us either. But this also brought up another question. Why the hell weren't they on guard against me? Didn't they get the news from Zhao's division? Wasn't that or maybe they didn't? Was there something I am missing here? A piece of the puzzle I can't see? No, for now, that wasn't something to worry about. Instead, these footprints were more of an urgent matter, as it meant that there were many people here that we couldn't see. Should I check the map? But that will block my vision for a split second. It's a little reckless with Master Firebenders so close, but Danger Sense should warn me before it happens. Also, Katara was on guard and would protect me. In the end, I decided to open my map, and the 3D image appeared all around me. The toad, instead of the usual blue lines, was fully covered in red. It was swarming with enemies. There were so many red dots that I could barely see the layout of the temple. Each of them was a Fire Nation soldier, and they were hidden within the secret rooms and passages of the temple. As we walked behind Arn, many thoughts came to mind. Katara was following my lead, so that meant that I would have to be the first one to act, and she would follow. These guys were planning something. Should I attack the Fire Sages right now? No, that would just cause the people around us to spring into action. As we walked in, we were greeted by some tight hallways. Then would a fight in these tight hallways be beneficial? Again, no. I had nowhere to escape the fire. How about an open field? I'd just jump out of the window with Arn and Katara. Fuck no. That would just make the numerical advantage even more obvious, and get us wrecked. Arn then won't be able to meet Roku. I could explain him what Roku wanted to say about the comet. Well, I could tell Arn that myself, but it would be troublesome and bring unnecessary questions. Also, even more spirits might start taking an interest in me. This will be hard, but I am confident in outplaying everyone around me, as long as I don't get arrogant. At least as some semblance of my future knowledge stood true. One of the fire sages, Shayu, I believe he was called, he signaled at me, shaking his head nervously and looking towards the walls where some hidden doors stood. Dumbass, stop being so obvious. I smiled at him and waved as if misunderstanding his signals as a greeting. This guy should just shut the hell up, if he knew that we were surrounded then he should just act normal and understand that even if I knew what message he was trying to send, it would only bring trouble to us all. Once we arrived at the top of the temple, the doors to Avataroku's chamber were open, and in the middle, the statue of Avataroku stood tall with a fist face. Please go on, Avatar, said the eldest fire sage, bowing respectfully. We will close the doors behind you so you can meet Avataroku. As Arn entered, the doors behind him closed and everyone stood silently. I already had my spear in my back and was ready for an attack at any moment now, but contrary to my expectations they just stood there and smiled at me. These guys, what are they planning? Letting Arn enter like that was illogical. What if he enters the Avatar state? Then wait that is their aim. A dozen scenarios played in my head, and I finally understood why there were so many Fire Nation soldiers hidden here. The sages were somehow knowledgeable that to kill the Avatar permanently, he needed to be in the Avatar state. But I don't think this knowledge was something that anyone would have. Even Zhao, who was in Hua Shai Tong's library, didn't know that. So there was only one option left, a spirit informed the sages. Which spirit had been in contact with us and wanted to harm me? Evil lady, the spirit of strife, she is working against me right now. Ding. For making a logical conclusion intelligence increased by two that spirit. I am not strong enough to defeat it, and probably won't be for a while. But I will kill that bitch. People that try to go against me will die. I will fucking drown them all in a river of blood if I have to. Sokka's malicious thoughts weren't shown on the outside at all. Instead, he seemed to be pretty relaxed and looked at the fire sages. So, 
Do you have any games here? Or we could do something to pass the time faster. The fire sages glanced at the young man. He casually walked towards them. But he dropped his spear on the ground, and the way he carelessly strode forward with a huge grin on his face, made them drop their guard around him. What was there to be worried about? He was just some foolish young man, in their eyes. How could he compare to the fire sages who have studied firebending their whole lives? Fwish. Sokka casually walked past them, and suddenly all of the fire sages' eyes widened. Shayu was the only one who seemed normal and glanced at his colleagues. Shayu looked on in shock as the other fire sages' faces turned purple, and they fell on the ground, grasping at their throats. Don't worry. I just blocked the Kai points in their throat, Sokka reassured the last standing man. Now tell me, what is happening? Shia immediately spilled the beans. A woman with dark hair and grey skin came to tell us how to kill the Avatar. She promised them glory, and they would be known as the great firebenders who killed the Avatar and finished him off for good permanently. Just as I expected, things always become messed up when people like her get involved. Sokka sighed. Ah, uh, what the hell are you talking about? Katara intervened, curious at what we were talking about. Oh, it's nothing. You know how your cool brother attracts females. They sometimes become just too crazy for me. At first, Katara was going to refute and dismiss such a foolish notion. But then she remembered how his departure with Suki ended. He had said the worst things he could say, and she ended up falling for him. You aren't cheating on Suki, are you? Huh. You make it sound like me and her were in some kind of serious relationship. Katara narrowed her eyes suspiciously. Just don't be a scumbag that goes around breaking girls' hearts. Are you getting involved in my love life now? Your love life? Why would I get involved in something non-existent? You can be such a bitch sometimes. What did you just say to me? Though they were both arguings, Kadara felt something strange. Like Sokka was trying to tell her something through their arguments. Something that he couldn't say out loud. Are we being observed? Ash wondered Katara. Shia looked at the bickering siblings and knew that if they made too much noise, it might alert the guards below them. They might come up and check, after all. By now they should have gotten the signal by the fire sages, yet they hadn't. So some might come and check. Excuse me, Mr. Sokka, Miss Katara, can you please not make too much nose dash? Shut the hell up. Don't interfere in our business, both of the siblings yelled simultaneously. They were the only ones allowed to critique each other if anyone else intervened. Then they would band together and bash the outsider. The fire sage wisely decided to back off, but he notices something strange. By now the Fire Nation soldiers in the hidden rooms below should have noticed something and come in charging. Why haven't they done that yet? What's going on there? Wondered Shai. Below the Avatar's floor, an injured Zhao, with one of his arms missing and a burned lower jaw, looks enraged towards his new prisoner. It was Zuko. He had just been caught here. The Fire Nation soldiers had filled the room. Now that someone with high commanding power like Zhao was here, the Fire Nation soldiers would have to listen to him. Zhao, I didn't even recognize you. What happened to you? Finally lost against someone who didn't spare you. Asked Zuko mockingly, even while in chains the prince hasn't lost his pride. He was here to capture the Avatar, and nothing would stop him from that. Zhao clenched his teeth as fire started to appear around his hands. The man was unable to control his emotions for now, as he had suffered great shame by having his men mutiny, and they almost killed him. Sokka on the upper floor was staring at his map while arguing with his sister, and he saw Zhao. Before when on the ship, he didn't have the time to go and finish off Zhao with his own hands. But now he had the perfect chance to kill him. Sokka had predicted that Zhao by now learned, the hard way, that running away while your men fight wasn't the best idea. He was counting on the Admiral being mad, angry, and swearing bloody revenge. Since Zhao must be in such emotional turmoil, then he will most likely lead his men, and he was confident in his ability to win, as hundreds of Fire Nation soldiers were here. That way, Sokka could finish him here and now. Of course, these thoughts were all speculation by Sokka, and anything could go wrong at any time. He knew that too. But at least there was a plan in place to finish off a person that could cause a lot of problems in the future. After finishing his arguments and leaving his sister seeming pretty annoyed, Sokka sat on the ground with his spear in his hand. He seemed to be as off guard as always, but instead, he was looking at the map, waiting for someone or something to appear. He wondered if Roku's talk with Arn was so long in the original story. But he dismissed such thoughts as soon as they came because they would be useless in what was going to come. Suddenly rapid footsteps were heard through the staircases, and a dozen Fire Nation soldiers burst through. Zhao was amidst them. He had positioned himself where it would be safe even while leading the charge. You bastard. Yelled out Zhao in anger as his eyes were filled with malicious intent as he stared at Sokka. I will kill you and your whole family. Katara froze in fear when she saw the madness in his eyes. But Sokka was different and instead he just had a casual smile on his face. Couldn't you come alone at least? He then got up and clenched the spear in his hand taking a throwing position which made Zhao back off in fear as the mad look disappeared from his eyes and his whole being was filled with terror at Sokka's gaze. Fwish. The spear flew through the air like a flash. Ah Zhao screamed when he saw the spear, heading towards him and fell butt first on the ground. 
Even though he knew that the spear couldn't pierce through the dozen of men in front of him were like meat shields. The unspeakable terror he felt wasn't something he could dismiss so easily. Monster clang. But, unexpectedly the spear had flown past everyone's head and landed on the rocks above. It had sunk quite deep into the stone, showing the terrifying power behind it. While Sokka's strength stat wasn't anything special, averaging at a 22. But with the stats boost from the spear, his strength became at a monstrous 72. Ha 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 Xiao laughed in joy, almost crazily, as he looked at the spear and then back at Sokka. You stupid boy. Ha 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 ha. You missed. You should really check what I was aiming for, before doing this villain speech, as it makes you look stupid. Sokka pointed towards the spear, and everyone looked at it. Cracks had spread around the place it had hit, and Shai, as a well-studied fire sage, was the first to catch on to what happened. That's genius. Shai couldn't help but praise the young man's intelligence. It was nothing short of brilliant for someone his age. The spot that the spear pierced was something so perfectly calculated that made Shia wonder how the young man was able to calculate things so precisely. As the crack on the sock spread, they covered the whole wall, and finally everyone caught what was going on. Sokka wasn't planning on killing Zhao with that attack, he intended to trap him in, and keep the rest of the troops out. By now quite a lot of troops had tiredly climbed through the stairs, but only to look on in despair as Sokka's spear throw had caused major damage to the structure of the wall above them. Everyone go back. Run. The ceiling is going to fall on us. Yelled the men as they tried running back. But due to being a big group in such a tight place, the stairs and hallway leading to the room fell, and many red dots disappeared from the gamer map. Sokka felt a sense of glee rising within him, as he just made the numbers advantage the enemy had useless. The firebenders would be unable to pass through to them for quite a while, so he wasn't worried how long Ung would take anymore. E dash please, spare us. No, even sparing me is enough, please. Zhao was the first to grovel, knowing the situation that he was in now had become dire. But Sokka wasn't feeling merciful, and even if he had to kill someone in front of his sister, he didn't mind it right now. She would forgive him later, they were family, and he believed that their bond wouldn't break over him killing someone. He glanced at the Fire Nation soldiers and simply said, You are not my target. Do you want to sacrifice your lives for a cowardly commander willing to sacrifice your lives without a second thought? Amongst the dozen soldiers, some took on fighting positions, while the others gave up and went to the side. The Fire Nation soldiers never give up, yelled out one of the soldiers who was willing to fight. Seeing no other resolution to the situation, Sokka took a knife out of his pocket, which was the trick he always used to hide bringing something out of his inventory. A fierce atmosphere enveloped him, and it felt like a fierce beast had just pulled out its claws. Killer intent leveled up to level 2 Killer intent leveled up to level 3 Killer intent leveled up to level 4 Killer intent leveled up to level 5 Killer intent An intimidation skill that was essentially useless most of the time leveled up as Sokka looked the Fire Nation soldiers willing to oppose him right in the eye. It unnerved them, especially since with each passing second, the dangerous feeling around their enemy seemed to intensify. As Sokka walked closer, they could sense their heartbeats clung in their heads as they saw the young man with a malicious aura and evil gaze in his eyes casually walk towards them. It felt like their blood seemed to clot in their veins due to fear. We give up, please don't kill us. Even the soldiers willing to fight against him had their wills crushed by the pressure alone. What can we do against such a guy with only this many people? Those were the thoughts of everyone who initially decided to fight. If they had more people with them, this wouldn't have worked. But now it was different, the hundreds of soldiers that had gathered here had become useless as they couldn't enter the room. Ash Sokka POV seeing that they had given up, I smiled gently at them. Good choice. Then I casually walked towards Zhao. Having all of these firebenders gathered here was dangerous even for me. They were stupid with their decisions were made during a moment of blinding fear and greed. Fwish. I threw my dagger at Zhao, his eyes widened in fear, and he tried to pull back to dodge the knife. But it was all for naught because with the speed it was thrown at him lying on the ground, he wouldn't be able to dodge it. As the dagger was about to sink in his forehead, it suddenly stopped mid-air, making me frown. This wasn't planned, and the space cracked open. A grey hand came through and grabbed the levitating knife. You seem very insistent on killing this man. The familiar, feminine, and hypnotic voice came through the crack. Long black hair, yellow eyes with red air eyes, and also wearing a purple dress. Unknown, unknown nothing, no information on her was gotten by using observe. Even though I already was almost 100% sure of who she was. The woman was the evil lady, and I have to say, while she was beautiful, I have never wanted to kill someone more than her. Before, she only observed me, but now, she directly intervenes in my life. I will kill her with my own hands, if she wants to mess around I will play her games. I it's you, stuttered Shai, while pointing at the woman fearfully. Oh, you are one of those fire priests. Did you put the information on how to kill Rava to good use? She inquired amusingly while her eyes were glued on me. She wanted a reaction out of me, but sadly for her, I won't be giving her any. As expected, she was the one who gave the fire sages the information about how to kill the avatar permanently. You were able to correctly predict a carefully thought scheme, intelligence increased by one. 
but this bitch didn't know something. She had no idea of the future, but I did. Now it will have to become a battle of time. After all, I'm was going to come out as Roku. Let's see how she handles fighting against one of the strongest spirits. Oh, you are hiding something. The evil lady had an entertained smile on her face. As expected, someone like her who had lived so long wasn't stupid. Fwish. Within a second, before I could even react she was in front of me, and the palm of her hand was on my forehead. Let's see what intriguing thoughts are hidden in here. As the palm of the evil lady touched Sokka's forehead, a sense of coldness emanated from where she touched him. It felt like his mind was freezing in a jar of ice. The sensation was extremely painful. Ding. A powerful existence is trying to read your mind gamer's mind is activating at full force to fight off the existence. Trying to invade your mind gamer's mind has labeled the opposing entity as dangerous. Sokka felt a headache like never before, and it was as if his brain was split in half and electrocuted. Though this all seemed to happen in a split second, to him it felt like hours passed in this excruciating pain. His his head felt like a balloon about to burst. Ag his screams of pain bellowed out of his throat and worried Katara who immediately got ready to attack the evil lady as water came out of her punch fluidly. For the first time, without her even knowing herself, Katara was ready to kill someone. The evil lady also known as the Spirit of Strife, if she was to use her full powers, she could easily claim to be one of the strongest spirits out there, and she wouldn't be lying either. Her power was something that not many could match. Still, for the first time in her long life, she encountered something she had never seen before. Her consciousness, which had entered Sokka's mind since it would need to do so to read his mind, stood in a dark and empty space. Looking around it was all like a dark mist so thick that she couldn't even see her own hands. She was supposed to be inside Sokka's mind and looking at his memories. But right now, she was just surrounded by a heavy dark mist that seemed almost otherworldly. Is his head empty? She joked, not worried about it too much. After all, in this world, there were very few things that she was worried about. It had been thousands of years since she felt threatened by something. And she didn't believe some weak human without bending could do anything against her. Suddenly, a bright light shone above her, and the dark mist split, revealing a dark eye looking at her. The pupil of the eyes was the darkest thing she had ever seen. That made the black mist seem bright in contrast. Foreign being extermination begins. Gamer's mind activating on full power inside the user's mind. A robotic voice that seemed to come from everywhere around her said, using Luxstat to control the destiny in the user's mind. Chances of success in exterminating the invader. 99.99% What? The evil lady frowned at the words, a little worried because if she died here, then her existence would become like that of a vegetable. A strong spirit without consciousness was just a juicy fruit for others to kill, as in a vegetative state, she wouldn't be able to defend or attack anything or anyone. Even moving would be impossible as her consciousness would be exterminated. But she soon calmed herself. Being as old as her wouldn't let such trivial things bother her, and instead, she now needed to find a way to get out of here. Hey, let's see just how dash she stopped mid-sentence as her arms started ripping apart. Hundreds of years of memories were lost just like that. If someone lost their memories, were they still themselves? That was a question many asked. But she didn't need the answer to that, because it wasn't just memories that were destroyed. The evil lady no longer spoke as veins popped in her consciousness, as she tried to keep her existence from ripping apart. Damn, he has a mind defensive system. I never saw or heard of a human having this. Ash for the first time in a long, long time, she felt an emotion she had long since forgotten fear. No, it was absolute despair. Dread settled over her heart. This was no longer a game she could play around with a warrior for entertainment, having their deaths turn into amusing laughter for her. Instead, it turned into a deathmatch, a fight for her own existence. A battle to not end in a place that was worse than death. Damn, 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 how the hell did it turn out like this? Dash the evil lady panicked, as she finally gathered enough power to try and escape Sokka's mind. Harmful entity detected inside the user's body. The high luck of the user has taken a higher effect. Direct destiny manipulation beginning again. The robotic voice delivered soul-crushing news to her, in a literal manner. Crack. 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 Random cracks started appearing all over the evil lady's soul and consciousness. She couldn't fight against whatever was affecting her. Normally luck was a very passive stat and it had the most minimalistic effect in the world. The gamer interface couldn't directly affect the outside world, so the luck stat became something like a passive and uncontrollable effect. It would never hurt his enemies directly or even help Sokka in a fight normally that is. But right now, the evil lady had made the mistake of entering Sokka's body. Here luck itself had a very active role, it manipulated fate and destiny itself to stop her. Essentially she entered a place where with gamer's mind was its god. One couldn't fight against such an absolute force. She now knew. No, maybe she knew all along. But only now did she truly comprehend what was happening to her. Sokaya the evil lady called out his name desperately. Please stop this I promise to never harm you again. An unbreakable deal shall be made upon my soul. She was desperate, so she spewed things out, and an X mark appeared over her heart when she said the words out loud. 
Usually, she would make deals that trick the opponent, but right now, she couldn't do so, and was worried about even surviving this. Suddenly, Sokka's figure appeared midair, and he looked around, seemingly surprised by being able to even be here. Whoa, I didn't know my meditation skill could be used like this. He looked at his opponent and smiled as if he was about to help her. Sorry lady but I can't control this. Even if I could, helping you isn't something that seems useful. Please, I will do anything. Though she had lived a long life, the evil lady was terrified of death. No, this was even worse than death as her existence was being extinguished. What was even worse than the unknown was knowing that she would turn into nothingness. She tried to make herself pitiful, and used her beautiful face to try and entice the young man to do something to save her. Something that she had never had to do before so genuinely. Sokka just stood in the darkness, which seemed to accommodate him. In here it was his domain now, and he could control everything. Even let the evil lady go. But he wasn't planning to do that, and neither would he ever tell her that he had the power to let her go. Because Sokka didn't know if she actually might be able to escape from here. Though the chances were low, he didn't want her to hold a hateful grudge that might turn against him in the future. Seeing your worst, most dangerous enemy being crushed and destroyed was a euphoric feeling. Sokka would be lying if I said that having the evil lady almost destroyed didn't make him happy. Even then, he not even once held any thought of arrogance, nor did he act vindictively. That would be a stupid thing to do. Instead, he just looked on passively. The luck stat was terrifying when it came to a situation like this. For the first time, Sokka saw the potential it could achieve. It felt that no matter what the evil lady did, she wouldn't be able to escape. Was this the full unrealizability of luck? The stat that he had determined to be the strongest. After calming down for a bit, a certain thought passed his mind. How useful would this girl be? Because right now there was an opportunity to make her mine. Well, when in doubt activating gotcha random roll use luck to determine things. If something comes out that would give him more benefits than killing her would, then Sokka will help her. If not, she will die here. Sadly for her, just having a pretty face wasn't enough to convince him. You have gotten. I bracket a piece of paper appeared in my inventory, and I immediately checked what it was. She is, epic and magical contract thought to be unbreakable, and that it binds the soul. Even after death, the contractors have to abide by their deals. Both parties must willfully and verbally agree on the signed contract. Warning, right with caution, the contract's power can harm even the one who initiated it if they are not careful with the wording. Sokka looked on at the contract in wonder. This was the first time he had gotten something so amazing and dangerous. Immediately, his first thought was to use it on Arn. Screw the evil lady, in comparison she wasn't anything now, and wouldn't give him any substantial benefits in the long run. Now, Arn was a good friend and Sokka cared deeply about him. But at the same time, having the whole avatar existence under his control sounded even better. He reasoned that Arn can live his life as he wanted, Sokka doesn't need to interrupt that since their goals are aligned. But in case he needed something from one of the future avatars, then he just has to request them to do something for him. It would be amazing. Such a weapon in his hands wouldn't have him dominate the humans, but even the spirit world. Still, though, Sokka took a deep breath to calm his greed, and immediately, with a calmer mind, he realized there was one problematic thing. While it said that even death wouldn't break the contract, then what about rebirth? The avatar was in an endless cycle of rebirth and death. Since the contract seemed so strict in its wording, then it probably doesn't cover reincarnations. Sokka cursed like a sailor in his mind his dreams of having the avatar, which was the equivalent of a reusable nuclear weapon, destroyed. Since he was a little mad, the smile on his face became crooked as he asked the evil lady, hey, want a bargain? Her body shook, and only now did she realize another thing. When she was on the outside, Sokka wasn't dangerous to her as she had an overwhelming upper hand on him. But now having him be the one in charge, it was terrifying. It made her clench her teeth and eyes become bloodshot, knowing that from now on, she will never be the same. Though Sokka asked her if she wanted to bargain, he had half a mind to her and get the experience points. When he used observe on her, not even the name was shown so she had to be over level 200 or even 300. At least that was what he predicted. There was the temptation to have her killed and level up but he knew that at best he would only get a dozen levels. Also when killing such an enemy who has hunted him down, it will make him feel happy. But temporary satisfaction or decisions based on emotion weren't something Sokka planned to make. While killing might unlock a new system option due to leveling up, it would be a stupid decision based on temporary benefits. Sokka knew that, so with clenched teeth, he had to force himself to not kill her and think of the future benefits. No, she must become my mule. Since I can't use skills like ID create, leveling up is hard. Also, humans are not the best at leveling up, since their levels are too low. Farming them sounded like a bad idea too, as it would have them band together to kill me. Ash with a heavy heart, Sokka knew what had to be done. The evil lady probably knew quite a lot of other spirits that he could kill and power level from. But then again, the Jia's contract didn't seem to be unbreakable, 
What if she finds a method to get reborn? Sokka contemplated putting in a clause that stopped her from being reborn or even trying to break the contract. In the end, he only shook his head. Such a strategy might work on other people, but the evil lady was smart and cunning. The only thing such clauses would show her was hints on how to break the contract. She might even use the clause to kill herself and reincarnate. Dangerous people sometimes were dangerously smart too. Sokka knew he was messing around with powers beyond his knowledge, but he was willing to do so, believing in his own effort and growth. He would surpass the evil lady by the time she figured out how to break the contract. The jeers while to others it might seem unbreakable, and might bet on it to keep someone like the evil lady under control. Sokka already saw the contract as something breakable, and it was only a matter of time before she figured out a loophole in it. So many choices, but also having to weigh the benefits and potential risks made things more complicated. Everything had a risk to it. There was no lying to that. But what Sokka was trying to do is take on a calculated risk, where even if he couldn't control the outcome, he could at least predict it. In the end, he made the decision that should lead him to faster success. Even if things go bad, by then he should be strong enough to handle it by himself. Scribbling down some clauses that left a lot of loopholes to his benefits, and a couple that the evil lady could use, Sokka decided to offer her the contract, and immediately, his luck stopped attacking her, and she seemed to move easier. But Gamer's mind was still pressuring her. Sign this. She looked at the contract, and without contemplating much she signed it in a drop of light. That seemed almost like divine water, flew out of her finger, and was absorbed by the paper that rolled and disappeared. There were some loopholes that she would think about later and be able to figure out, but this was better for Sokka. Because this way he could at least predict what she would do next. You have gained a new title. Schema due to scheming, intelligence increased by one. The new title gave him five intelligence and wisdom when equipped. But it was better than nothing, and when in the future, he might have a mental battle, equipping it will be useful. But for now, Legendary Beast Slayer was the best title he had available and wasn't going to change it anytime soon. The pressure around the evil lady disappeared, and her figure dissipated from inside Sokka's mind. She had a despairing look on her face, knowing that she had been beaten in a battle of minds. The contract essentially made her Sokka's slave, he didn't take it easy on her, she did try to kill him after all. In reality, not even a second had passed, though it seemed to Sokka and the evil lady, hours had gone by. Katara was in mid-motion to pierce the evil lady's head with an ice spike. For the first time in her life, a cold and emotionless look had taken over her features. She was ready to kill to protect her brother. This was a murder that she would commit without an ounce of hesitation, because doing so in such a situation might cost Sokka's life. Please be on time. Ash Katara begged in her mind, hoping that she hadn't been too slow, and Sokka wasn't dead because of her slowness. Just as the ice spike was about to pierce the evil lady's head, the spirit's hair lengthened and moved like it had a mind of its own, grabbing the ice spike as if it was nothing and crushing it. Katara immediately and unconsciously gathered the water in the air, attempting to strike down her brother's attacker. But she stopped, noticing that unlike the amused look from before, the unknown woman had a despair-filled gaze. This can't be happening. I, Eris, the spirit of strife, the evil lady have become someone's slave. She couldn't believe it even though it was in front of her eyes. Sokka had an emotionless glare in his eyes as he gazed at the woman in front of him. But there was one person who hadn't caught what was going on here. Ha 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 ha, I am Xiao, destined to be the Moon Slayer. Destiny itself can't dash shut up. The evil lady hollered out stressfully as tears came out of her eyes. Zhao immediately stopped talking as his head slid off his neck in a clean cut. The evil lady's hair had blood dripping from them. Before anyone could even notice, she was the one who had killed the man by extending her hair and cutting his neck. Even Sokka was surprised as he too hadn't sensed anything. Not even the shifting of air, and by the time he knew anything, Zhao was dead. Ash, I was lucky that she never saw me as someone she wanted to kill. Instead, she just played around, which led to her loss. The spirit of strife had a hollow look in her eyes as she kept staring at her hands. No, 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 how could this happen? Sokka chuckled, drawing her attention, making her look at him. He just casually walked towards her and patted her head. It wasn't in a loving manner like he usually did with Katara. Instead he petted the evil lady, as if she was his dog, and the smug smirk on his face said it all. Good doggy now you should follow my orders and go back to the spirit world, stop any spirit from trying to look into me. If you can, keep them alive and notify me so I can get the last hit on them, okay? She didn't answer and just looked down in despair. It seemed like she had not adapted to the reality of the situation yet. Sokka helped her with that as his petting turned into a rough tug, as he grabbed her hair and made her look him in the eye. Listen here, bitch, you just tried to kill me. So don't test me. I am not going to be merciful. Next time you don't listen to my orders, I will do unimaginable tortures upon your body. You might be a slave, but it's better than being dead. She nodded absentmindedly as slowly some life seemed to come into her eyes, and a swell of darkness appeared in space, and she jumped through it. Sokka was relieved, he didn't want to be unnecessarily cruel to a strong being, who could break the contract eventually. Still, he knew that not doing anything would make him a pushover, 
where it would have her test his limits, and how far she would be able to push. Eventually the spirit of strife, or as she called herself, Eris, would calm down and think things through in a rational manner. He had outsmarted her this time due to the unexpected existence of Gamer's mind. That skill was something offerably that the evil lady would have never been able to predict its existence. Sokka knew that the evil lady wasn't someone who would be so docile for long. So he didn't want to test things against her. And he also knew that if it came to schemes, he was at a big disadvantage against her. Creek suddenly the temple door opened and Arn came out. He was in his normal form. And he had a thoughtful look on his face as he stared at Sokka. This immediately made Sokka cautious and became on guard against Arn. What did Roku say? Did he say something about me? Dash wondered Sokka. He was a little tense right now, and his mind was still in a fight or flight response. His pupils dilated to an unnatural degree as he observed his Arn, who was also his best friend in this world. Still, he tried to get rid of his tenseness and walked towards Arn. What did Roku say? Did he call you for some reason? Arn was about to answer when he caught sight of Zhao's decapitated body and his eyes widened in shock. Katara also had the same reaction as she kept staring into the Admiral's decapitated head as he had his mouth and eyes open, seeming like he wanted to say something. Seeing this Sokka forgot about his questions for Aang, seeing that he wouldn't answer them currently. Instead, as an older brother, he went and hugged Katara, comforting her. Don't worry sister, everything will be alright, he was a bad man killed by an evil woman. Though he said that, Sokka knew it would only be a temporary distraction before she started asking questions. After all, how was Sokka able to take control of such an enemy? And many other questions would follow after that. Will our familiar bond hold through this? Ash wondered Sokka, because he knew that in the end, he wouldn't tell his sister about the gamer interface. I am not worried for him, I am worried about you. What if you had died there? I couldn't do anything, muttered Katara, as his tears stained his shirt. Sokka smiled and patted her head gently. Don't worry. Sister, I will never die. Seems like I misunderstood her feelings. Do not worry little sis. Things have just become very interesting. Ash Katara POV. It felt like my brother had become a different person. By now, a couple of days had passed since the time we were at Avataroku's temple. We stopped in a town, and my heart beat anxiously as I stared at my brother as he bought the necessary things we would need for our journey. For the first time, back when that grey-skinned woman touched his forehead, I thought he was going to die, something that I never thought about before. Knowing that someone will die and truly understanding what it means are different things. Arn had said that Sozin's comet was coming soon, so he had to rush and try to master all four of the elements, faster than any avatar had done before him. Sokka, like all always, seemed unworried, but I and Arn were on edge. I offered to teach him waterbending and he surpassed me in days. Normally I might have been a little jealous, but right now my main concern was my brother. Why was he acting like nothing had happened even when he saw a decapitated head? It was just two evil people killing each other. That was his nonchalant response. Or maybe he was prepared for this. Unlike me and Arn, maybe Sokka had anticipated something like this happening. It wouldn't be surprising, as I knew Sokka was smarter than anyone else I have ever met. Even though he always did quirky and strange things. Like looking at the space in front of him, as if something was there. Or how he even touches the empty air. That was the least weird amongst the things he did. As we walked through the marketplace, many thoughts went through my head. I noticed my brother holding two bags of supplies without much difficulty. Katara. I saw that you had some difficulty with waterbending. I could hear the mocking tone in his voice and knew he did it intentionally. But by now I had gotten used to it and dash honestly. It's kinda embarrassing just how bad you still are at waterbending. Water came out of my pouch, and a whip of liquid formed trying to hit the back of his stupid empty, brainless skull. Fwish. But like always, as if he had eyes on the back of his head, Sokka tilted to the side and dodged the attack completely. A calls. That's why your dear brother has a good solution to it. He took out a scroll from his pocket. Opening it revealed waterbending moves and sequences along with it. Have I ever told you that you are my favorite brother? I yelled out excitedly and hugged him. This was the closest thing I would get close to having a genuine waterbending teacher. Favorite. I am your only brother. He muttered, but didn't do anything annoying. And just handed the scroll over to me. Looking at it. I noticed by the ink that it was newly made. Wait, was there some waterbender around these parts? They would be able to teach me if that was the case. Where did you get this? I made it myself, obviously. Sokka shrugged, as if what I asked was supposed to be common knowledge. If you are going to lie, at least make it believable. I didn't voice out my disagreements about what he said since I was in a good mood. Plus Sokka would overplay it and make an argument out of nothing. Ugh, he always did that. Arguing with him is like punching a porcupine rabbit. Just not worth it, no matter how angry you are. Anyway, I gotta go and do something. Train with Arn, and don't run off without me. He said, narrowing his eyes suspiciously while walking away. Sometimes he was silly like that, but I loved him for that lackluster attitude and dependable personality, when the situation calls for it. Also even after all this, he was still family. What Katara didn't know was that Sokka has spent the last two days talking with Zabuza, 
and asking everything he knew about the transformation jutsu. Since it didn't work for Vali, it wouldn't work for Sokka either. That was a logical conclusion to assume. After all, they were in different worlds. But, there was one unaccountable thing. One random code in the Matrix. That was the gamer interface. Such an unorthodox existence could change everything. Sokka walked towards one of the forests and took out a book. It was titled Transformation Jutsu. He has tried learning it the normal way. But it was impossible as his MP didn't work like Chakra at all. Skill book detected. Transformation Jutsu do you want to learn? Transformation Jutsu Y slash and of course, Sokka clicked on the yes. Immediately, the book turned into specters of light and went towards his body, being absorbed by it. Error. You don't possess Chakra MP has adapted and can be used as Chakra 2 as he had expected, even after writing Katara's waterbending scroll. Sokka could feel all of the knowledge in the book sink into his head, as he now knew how to use the transformation jutsu. I thought there would be some pain with my MP adapting to Chakra. Where are the cliches in these things? Sok jokes. But he was quite excited at the prospect. He did three hand signs. Pull off an unnecessarily big cloud of smoke burst around him, and out of it came a balloon like on. He had no shape and seemed like a badly made toy. Looking at himself, Sokka sighed. Well, it seems like training this skill is the only thing I can do now. For the first time since he came here, Sokka had a couple of free days to make some traditional grinding. He would farm the transformation jutsu to its core till he could do it in his sleep. Though, he had one small message to leave to his abuser. Since lately, the ninja had been busy with something, he was online only at certain times. Vali was the same too. They were both busy. Then a thought came to his mind. Do we maybe have different time zones? Sokka shook his head dismissing such a thought and typing in the chat. E-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. I couldn't learn the transformation jutsu. No matter how hard I tried. But since we have bending, how about you send me a water jutsu? One that's not just moving water but also creating something. Sokka of course wanted another jutsu to learn, but he couldn't ask that directly, as Zabuza was unlikely to give it without getting something in return. Sokka wouldn't mind repaying him, but he had nothing of value he could give to the Jonah Ninja. Well, he had information about the Naruto world, but he wasn't going to give that information to Zabuza even if he did. The man would ask too many questions and start getting suspicious again. Sokka has spent a lot of effort to make Zabuza let his guard down when they were talking, and he wasn't going to waste that opportunity. After that, Sokka went back to training. A couple of hours later, Sokka was surprised by his progress. He didn't know whether it was because of his luck, or maybe the skill was easy to master. But transformation jutsu level 55 that was the result of just some hours of training. And while his transformations were still inclusionary, this kind of progress was crazy. After all, in the Naruto world kids went to the ninja academy and studied the transformation jutsu, yet some would still be unable to do it. Sokka mastered the thing within hours. Was my agility too high? Maybe. He wondered, after all, as agility was a general stat that covered everything even hand-to-eye coordination. Something that would help with hand signs. No, it was a combination of my luck, agility, and everything else. Still, this made Sokka excited. That was when he got a new notification. Miss Demon, you want a water jutsu? Well, I have just the one in mind. Seeing Zabuza's reply made me chuckle a little. After all, now that I have this power, I wouldn't consider myself an army killer, as I only knew one jutsu which at best had a minimal impact on battle. But the potential of Chakra was still there. Even if by this limited time I wouldn't be able to make something of myself within the year. After all, I still plan to hide as much of his abilities as I could. That included being able to even bend. Sure, using them in a desperate situation was a must. But right now the best thing to do is to simply hide until I can handle the hidden dangers in this world. Just imagining how the battle against the evil lady would have ended if she knew my powers made a chill crawl up my spine. I only wanted to be known as a weapons user and had many titles and skills that suited perfectly for that. So when an enemy who thought could beat me came around, I could pull out my waterbending and jutsus. E-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Show me which one then, Miss Demon. This will take a while to write out, but I will give you the best explanation I can. Seeing that it would take Zabuza a while to write out, I closed the chat tab and went back to training my skills. Training for long times was a luxury for me, and most of the time I trained when everyone else was sleeping. Still, the time limit hung over my head. Would I be able to become strong enough to handle the Fire Nation's attack, and take them down before Sozan's Comet, or would I fail? These were the kind of questions that plagued my mind. In reality, I could run away, and probably would or so to fight another day, if the situation becomes dire. But that was only as a last resort. I wasn't the kindest guy, I knew that. But watching suffering happening in front of me wasn't something I enjoyed either. People like Arn had optimism but failed on the practical side. Now, while people starving was pitiful, the world worked on realism, wishes and thoughts of well-being, never helped anybody. Do you know how to help people though? Greed the cardinal sin that represented humanity. Everyone had it. So, while I was willing to help those who were in need, I would only do so for my benefit. 
By benefits of course it meant quests. This was the only ability that I could think of that would allow a consistent income of experience points. Sure, I might be able to gain the same experience points by killing people, but that would just be needless trouble. While quests took more time in general, one person could essentially be an infinite amount of experience points. Killing them for a limited experience point sounded wasteful. That's why it was better to be a benevolent leader than a tyrannical ruler. If history had taught me anything, it was that tyranny didn't work. Of course, as long as it wasn't out there in plain sight. Still, from now on I need to start building my own image. More than just being that guy that travels with the avatar. Ding. Miss Demon sent a message yes. This was what I had been waiting for. Opening up there was the description of the water clone Jutsu. Now, this was what I needed, a clone technique. In this world, this technique might not be too strong, especially at its lower levels. But it was useful. Since writing had turned into a skill, taking out a blank book from the inventory. I wrote over a thousand words in less than 10 minutes. In the end, I learned the water clone Jutsu by using the newly made skill book. Going through the hand signs, my chakra moved out of my body and took the form of a water clone. Oh, this is weird. It felt like I could still control him remotely with my mind, and give him pre-programmed orders. I wonder what kind of genius was able to come up with techniques like this. After all, chakra was generally used to change into elements and attack. But jutsu like these to me were more impressive. E-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. It worked. After writing that to Zabuza, I closed the chat. Lying to him earlier was just so I could get a free Jutsu. From now on, this relationship between us would become mutually beneficial. Zabuza wasn't the kind of guy to go around giving freebies and charity. I too wasn't someone who would give him free information. From now on, we won't be just simply friends, but also business partners. His reply might take a while. I could roughly guess that he was in a civil war against the Hidden Mist Village, helping Mei Rumi become the next cage. His life was moving along now, and he hadn't even met Kakashi this time around. I wonder how Naruto and Sasuke of that world will end up. They just missed a huge opportunity to develop. Well, it isn't my problem, and their lives don't affect mine anyway. Still, Zabuza might die during Kagaya's takeover. So just in case, I will have to make our dealings as distinct as possible. First I have to pay him handsomely for the water techniques that he will give me, and after that, I will ask for other techniques, which since they won't be water jutsu, their price would be low. After all, from Zabuza's view, such jutsu would be useless to me since I can't use them. That illusion will take a long time to build into his brain, but this was a must. Zabuza might not be a merchant, but he was undoubtedly intelligent. If I give him an inch, he will take a mile. Going back to where I had rented an inn room for us, Katara and Aang were back, talking about something, sneakily walking. I listened in on their conversation. I don't think that's a good idea, muttered Arn, unsure of something. Momo then made some cute noises. Look, even Momo disagrees. Don't worry, Sokka will agree. Does he look like the kind of guy who would be okay with wasting time like this? It's not a waste of time, we are helping the people. Taking a deep breath, I kicked the door, slamming it open loudly. Bam, constant vigilance. I yelled out, freaking Momo, Kiwi and Katara shot water at me, which I was able to barely dodge thanks to sense danger. Seems like my little sister has gotten better. Nice shot Katara, you almost hit me. Maybe now you might be able to hit an enemy she smiled at my compliments. Glad to finally learn my acknowledgement. Of course, the enemy will have to be old, out of shape, and barely moving. But at least you can hit something. You know, in this enclosed space I can hit you if I try, right? So if I was you, pissing me off wouldn't be in your best interest. Katara said coldly. Oh, what's this? Did my sister finally get the guts to oppose me? Well, this isn't bad. I can use this as a way to teach her about life, and how sometimes unexpected scenarios happen. Seeing the smirk that was about to form on my face, Katara paled. She knew I was about to start an argument that would last a long time, and tire her out, by the end, if we will forget what we were even arguing about. The excuse I have for this is that I am helping her train willpower. Anyway, what were you guys talking about so secretly? I asked them. Arm looked uncomfortable. Katara on the other hand looked me in the eyes and said, Brother, we need your help. Oh, the sky is also blue. I added on with what I knew was a smirk on my face that irritated her. You always need my help, so tell me what it is. It seemed like she was about to blood bend my head off. But she took a deep breath to calm herself. She was becoming more patient than before and learning how to control her anger. It seems like my dear sister has some talent even in these things. So, come on now what is it? I asked her while crossing my arms. We need to help some revolutionaries fight against the Fire Nation. Oh, okay. I didn't see a problem here. We kinda helped them out already, without you knowing, unedited innocently, which made Katara send him a death glare. Now, I understood that Katara was at an age where she was curious, 
and wanted to be a little rebellious, thinking that she could handle the battles of the world. But I knew she wasn't ready. This world was dangerous. I wasn't angry she helped revolutionaries or whatever. Still, as an older brother, she needed to know that getting in these kinds of situations would worry me. That could lead to danger. Though she was young, Katara was bound to make mistakes. But as her brother, I will be here to teach her to not make the same mistake twice. Well, it was better for things like this to appear now, rather than during an important moment. Katara, you are free to do what you want, but don't be stupid. Huh? She seemed confused. Did she expect me to be angry or something? What? I asked her back, my eyes sharpening dangerously. Just remember, the world isn't black and white. It doesn't mean that whatever rebels you have chosen to help will be good, or the Fire Nation soldiers you have decided to destroy will be bad. So be careful, don't do something without thinking it through. Yes, she nodded excitedly. Unlike the normal soccer, I was responsible. So she understood and held my words at a higher value than she would have normally had. Still, it was a high chance my words just flew over her head, and there was nothing I could do about it. Just be careful. She nodded and went to bed excitedly. Sometimes I forgot that my sister was just a 14-year-old girl. This was due to her talents and exceptional intelligence, but it's normal for people her age to do reckless things. That's how we grow as people. Though I guess it was normal for people my age to do stupid things too. But my mind was older than my body. Arn looked at me and smiled. Sokka, you should sleep sometime too. Oh, this little shit. He knew something, as expected. Roku told him information about me. Well, I doubt the avatar was omnipotent. But their spirits might have seen me not sleep. It was a matter of time before it happened. Don't worry. I usually have to tire myself out before going to sleep. That's the only way I can get a full night's rest. Oh, okay, Arn said reluctantly. Seems like the little guy is sad. Time to change the subject. By the way... What was the name of those revolutionaries? They are called the Freedom Fighters, and their leader is Jed. We heard about them from some Fire Nation soldiers, and decided to go and check things out. Arn exhilarated and made hand movements to describe the scenario and how it happened. So they met with Jet. Well, that was bad, but it could be good. Because while Jet was manipulative and quite smart, he can be used as a tool to teach Katara and Arn a couple of lessons about trusting others. Also, Jet was useful for something else too. It was something that I had planned for quite a while. Training. I needed to do more of it, and due to liking to keep my secrecy about these things, I will have to separate from Katara and Un. Now was too early to show my power, or maybe I won't ever show my full power. But for now, there were dangerous spirits out there, and didn't want to draw their attention. Walking towards the door, I had a thoughtful look on my face and waved at Un. See you later. Make sure you get some rest. Immediately as I walked out, pulling out the map and making sure no one was following me, I went through some hand signs and spit out a small amount of water out of my mouth. The MP drained quite a bit, but an identical clone of myself appeared next to me. It's quite weird looking at you. I smirked at him. He just looked back at me without emotion. Right? He is more like a puppet than a living and thinking clone like shadow clones. Now, that was a technique worth getting my hands into. Protect them, with that simple order I just walked off. Water clones couldn't be too far away from the user as they would become weaker the further away they were. Even if they were close, they only had about 10% of my stats. So using them as a fighting force was useless. They had nothing more than numbers going for them. The best this water clone could do was maybe sacrifice itself. For now, though, he could take my place as I train. By the next day, Sokka was shirtless walking on water. Was it always this easy? While he didn't get a new skill, one of his already existing skills leveled up crazily. Mana control level 19 to 30. My physical stats had developed quite well too. Strength, 22 to 27. Agility, 44 to 45. Vitality, 22 to 25. Also, the other skills he had trained simultaneously were there too. Spear Mastery level 32 to 41 by now. Spear Mastery had developed at a level where it was the most useful skill I had in combat. Its increase in attack speed was very helpful too. Gathering my things. I opened my map and saw that Arn and Katara were close to the empty river spot. Were they waterbending? Also, my clone was in the town. They must have already filled the dam by now. Fuck. So Jet should already be at the dam. I zoomed in on the map through the river and found some yellow dots down it, meaning that there were some neutral people there. Well, now that I thought about it, this could be used as the ultimate kind of lesson. Katara and Arn will never forget it and will become better people. Looking at it from a logical standpoint, the Avatar might even become more hardworking and save more people. So the lives that would be sacrificed for the greater good. Sure, I would benefit from having an emotionally weak Avatar that would listen to me. Since the last time he didn't, a village was destroyed. That was what he would think every time I wanted Arn to do something. But at the same time, this wasn't an easy decision to make. After all, Arn might end up traumatized, Avatars were still human, and something similar happened to Korra, the Avatar in the series that would come after Arn. Ding. You have got a new quest oh, now this was interesting. Katara looked in despair as the explosion of the dam sounded out. Longshot had hit his target of the explosion jelly, 
and there was nothing either Ahn or her could do anymore. But Katara didn't give up at this time. Um, we need to reach the river before the water does. I will call Appa. Ahn yelled, and the sky bison appeared from the trees, and it landed on the ground with a swish of its tail. It slammed Jetta Tree, as he was trying to stop them from doing anything. Cough cough, there is nothing you can do now. Jet mocked them as he coughed out blood and fell unconscious. The rest of the freedom fighters went to help him, so Arn and Katara were able to easily float away. Kiwi looked at Katara curiously, tilting its little cute foxy head as if asking her what she has been up to. But neither Arn nor Katara said anything as Appa flew through the sky at breakneck speeds. When they arrived at the village, they saw something shocking. Giant ice spikes were protruding from the earth. It was something that would take a team of expert waterbenders to do due to the need for monstrous Kai. Yet, the whole water seemed to have frozen in a semi-wall structure, as if domed by a single person. As they got closer, Katara was able to keep the cold seeping into her bones. Along the icy mist stood a lone figure. Its shadow could be clearly seen. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.